What is up, wrestling fans, and welcome to the October edition of 2001, A Wrestling Odyssey, our journey back in time to the year 2001. Uh, checking out all the news, events that took place, and joining me, as per usual, on this journey back in time is Robert D. Felice. Well, thank you, Callum, and as per usual, you did not introduce yourself, so I'll introduce you, the host of this edition and all of the editions in the archives, Callum Wiggins. It's because I'm very, I'm a very giving person. I don't really think about myself that much, and so I just want to make sure everyone else on the podcast gets a, a bit more of a shine. Oh, that's nice, but you, you got to put yourself over there, bud. Well, what we're going to be putting over on this edition is basically our typical thing where we break down the news and events that took place uh, in the month of October, and then our two show reviews, because we have two this month, uh, WWF No Mercy, not the video game, but the pay-per-view from 2001, and World Wrestling All-Stars The Inception, the uh, first uh, pay-per-view from the World Wrestling All-Stars franchise, which was very short-lived. So we're going to break down a little bit about their history as well, because some people listening, I'm pretty sure, aren't familiar with what that promotion was anyway. I I watched this live. <laughs> ah, that's... Live live? Live live. When it, well, when it was going out in uh, when Australia? It, when it... No, I watched it when it aired. I guess it aired in the US in January of the following year, but I did see this event live, like when it aired on pay-per-view. I can only feel very sorry for you. If that was the case. <laughs> uh, good times when when wrestling, being good or bad, didn't matter because you're just a kid and you just want to see wrestling. Well, we'll be definitely breaking that down. That'll be the final thing we break down on this episode. But we'll start off with our typical reheated tags. Uh, let's start with some TV show notes from October 2001, Raw and SmackDown. Uh... We'll start with our usual game where we try and guess how many title matches took place in uh, on TV during this month. Rob, September had 19 type TV title matches take place. Uh, do you think October was more or less than this number? I'm going to go with just a little more. Well, it was just a little more. Well, it depends on what you say is a little more. Uh, so there was 19 title matches in September, 23 in October. <laughs> uh, how was, many of these are hardcore titles? Not many. <laughs> That's great. I, I don't even know if RVD actually defended the hardcore championship this month. So, yeah, there was a lot of tag team title matches in particular. So these are these are the title changes that took place in um, in October on TV. This is not counting No Mercy because we'll cover those separately. But uh, Steve Austin reclaims the WWF championship from Kurt Angle on an episode of Raw. Uh, at the same time, it, this was the uh, moment that William Regal turned his back on the WWF and joined the Alliance for no good reason whatsoever, no other than to just do, other than to just do a turn. Yeah, the Alliance uh, strikes again. Yeah, uh, the Hardy Boys defeated Booker T and Test for the WCW Tag Team Championships. Uh, yeah, Billy Kidman defeated X Pac for the Cruiserweight Championship. Is this X Pac's last title ever? Uh, I believe so, until he went to a TNA and won a few things. Okay. Uh, and But then Billy Kidman, only 11 days later, lost the Cruiserweight Championships to Jiri. Of course. <laughs> uh, Kurt Angle defeated Rhino for the WCW United States Championship. So, uh, it's not many people don't know that Kurt Angle won, because it was I, uh, just a very short-lived one. Well, it's kind of like the... Um... People forget that Booker T is a five-time WCW champion, but the fifth time occurs in the WWF. I mean, it's hard to forget that w the Booker T's a five-time WCW champion when all he talks about is the fact that he he's tells a you every time. <laughs> uh, Bradshaw defeated the Hurricane for the European Championship. This was at a point where um, Farouk was a little bit more in and out of the ring, because he was... He, hmm. I mean, he, he still wrestles until like as a full-time member of the roster until 2004, but he's a bit in and out from this point. And they uh, only saw something in Bradshaw, huh? Yeah, it's probably... You think it was that 9-11? <laughs> yeah, it's pro probably all that stuff, yeah. Uh, the Rock and Chris Jericho <laughs> won the uh, World Tag Team Championships from the Dudley Boys. So, yeah, They lose well, it quickly, though. I remember this. Yeah, but we'll t obviously talk a lot more about the Rock and Chris Jericho when we come to the No Mercy stuff. And the Dudley Boys then pretty much responded a couple of days later by defeating the Hardy Boys for the WCW Tag Team Championship. So, a lot, a lot of title changes taking place because there was just 
the titles were just switching between the Alliance and WWF members on a constant basis. Other than that, there's, there's not really too much in terms of real exciting stuff on television. The main storyline seems to be a lot of infighting within the Alliance. Steve Austin becoming intimidated by RVD's uh, growing presence in the group, which led to what we'll talk about, the No Mercy title match. And just a bit more like in fighting where there was an all alliance battle royal on an episode of SmackDown. So to determine the number one contender for Chris Jericho's WCW championship, uh, which Booker T ended up winning. So it's just a case of everyone in the Alliance can't really stand each other. And then there are certain people in WWF that can't stand each other either. So, so this is the beginning of like, all right, guys, you see that this isn't lasting forever. We're going to start ending this so we can get back to you know regular programming yeah it's pretty that's pretty much the case i mean after the no mercy pay-per-view uh the first episode of raw that took place was a promo between vincent man and linda mcmahon in the ring obviously a linda promo is always must see television (laughs) but um so they came out and after teasing they they were going to make out on live tv for a little while (laughs) were interrupted by shane and stephanie and that's that's how (laughs) Yeah, and that was the promo which led to the idea that Survivor Series would be the winner-takes-all match. So it was quite clear at that point that, well, they wanted to end this feud straight up once and for all in like just a couple of months after it started, which I guess is... Uh, like, it was again, just a failure. What, they had no it, alternative. Yeah, I know. They, they jumped ship on the entire idea knowing that everything had been going wrong in terms of I don't say everything, but the ratings had been dropping steadily. They weren't they weren't seen as the big deal anymore. They weren't the it thing in pop culture anymore. Yeah. So just wanted to move it on and do their own thing after that. So Vince ends up choosing his Survivor Series team on the final Raw of October, which initially was going to be The Rock, Kurt Angle, Chris Jericho, Kane and The Undertaker. But on that same episode, Shane McMahon and Vince McMahon had a street fight. So, following on from their WrestleMania 17 one, which we reviewed earlier, if you want to go back and check that episode. Uh, and in that match, Kurt Angle attacked Vince McMahon and attacked other people from the WWF and turned and joined the Alliance as well. Which was just, like, to this day, I don't understand. Well, no, it was completely nonsensical. But it was just, it, it. once we get into the thing that happened at Survivor Series, it makes a little bit of sense in terms of trying to plant him as the mole. But realistically, if they were going to do that with anybody, if anybody should had a realistic shot of turning and, make, and it making sense, it was Chris Jericho. Yep. Uh, he, but could have been, he could have been the leader, for God's sake. He d- had a career in WCW and ECW. I mean, so did Austin, but they didn't even play on any of that. No, and they decided to just go away from that idea and stick to Angle instead. I think it was partly due to the fact that Angle's babyface run had completely run out of steam. People just weren't... It, it wasn't sustainable for him to be a babyface. He was too good as a heel at this point in his career. Which is weird because he was connecting. Or like Earlier in the summer, he was connecting just fine. I think people still saw a lot of the corniness in him. Which I guess a lot of the people had that, but... Certain people like The Rock still had a bit more of an innate charisma about them that means they could get over it. Whereas Angle, they still treated him a little bit too much like a goofball. In well, yeah, scenarios. but I mean, he drank milk. Like, he literally drove a milk truck into the building. Like, that's yeah. super babyface, but that's also super corny. Uh, also, in terms of what took place, um, with William Regal switching over because he was the WWF commissioner and switching over to become the Alliance commissioner, it meant the return of Mick Foley as the WWF's commissioner for a short period of time. For like what three weeks? It was about it was about a month. It was post. I think the uh, night after Survivor Series, he quits and leaves WWF uh, for a while. I don't Wait, is that re- the one where they're on the plane? Yeah, and they they like legit get into it. I don't I don't think it's a legitimate thing, but obviously I I, I don't think I don't think Foley was happy being back in WWF. He was there for the paycheck, and that was about it. And he don't, I don't think he returns to WWF until 2003 after this. I think Foley has said in the past that there was some like legit tension 
on the plane. I, ima- I imagine there could be, because him and Vince didn't always see eye to eye. It probably says in one of his books what really took place there. Uh, but that's pretty much a lot of the news in terms of like what was happening on the main roster TV. But we can move on to talking about a little bit about Tough Enough, because on the like closing moments of September, that was when Maven and Nivea were crowned the winners of Tough Enough. And Maven made his debut on WWF TV during October on an episode of SmackDown, losing to Taz in a uh, just a straightforward one-on-one match. Uh, apparently, Vincent Mann had wanted Maven to win his debut because why not give the guy that you spent so many months building up on a reality TV show the win immediately, even if it would have been a fluky one. But yeah. apparently. But apparently he was talked out of it by people backstage saying that if Maven was to win, that would add to the resentment that he was already getting from people behind the scenes. Which is something that I don't know if it's for better or worse, but it's not evident anymore. Like, you, w- if somebody won a reality show today, they'd probably be welcomed with open arms. Yeah, I'd imagine so. There's, there's, there's a lot more, well, a lot less animosity between people that there would have been with people trying to protect their spot at this point in time. And I think it was just the concept, because Tough Enough was brand new, and they weren't very appreciative about the fact that a guy just won a reality TV show and was already getting a wrestler's contract, when most of those people had to bust their asses and pay their dues and all the other phrases you want to throw at it. I just don't think that they wanted... they They didn't respect him, and they didn't want him around there until he'd, you know put a few years of work into it. Yeah. But, and like we said before, Maven does get over. He does main event a Survivor Series in 04, but it, it's just like he never clicks. Nidia, I think, did better. Oh, Nidia, I think, was the better of the two, but she probably, well, she probably had a less tough time because the the women in WWF weren't exactly the most well-trained wrestlers at the time. There were a few of them, obviously, like Ivory and Molly Holly knew what they were doing, but certain other ones didn't as well. And she was going to be used mainly as a manager or eye candy anyway, so there was less pressure on her. I imagine she suffered, if it's possible, more cattiness from the women's side of things. Potentially, but uh, I wouldn't think it was... It, I, I won't imagine it would be too much of like a work, a work, like situation where she wasn't expected to perform in the ring or anything along those lines. So we will move on past that into a few other bits pieces in OVW news. So I'm hoping that we'd kind of escape the 9/11 talk right now, but uh, there's a little bit that we need to discuss, mainly about Jim Cornette. Jim Cornette's uh, not the most is is quite a polarizing figure nowadays, as it were, uh, with some of his views. I'm what not your... sure where you're going with this. Well, what what what's your opinion of Jim Cornette right now? So right now, as it stands, uh, October 26, 2019, I I feel like he has steered far too much into the skid with this "I'm an angry old man" thing. I love Jim Cornette as a historian. I think he is. Genuinely one of the best people to listen talk to about the older days of wrestling. But I think yeah, he's getting yeah, a little he's... too grotesque with the way that he feels about today's wrestling. Yeah, I think the reason why he's such a great historian to talk about the old days of wrestling because that seemingly is where he's still living in, yeah. <laughs> in his mind. <laughs> it's very possible, but I will, like, I love the Midnight Express. I love everything he's given to the industry. I just wish he would stop being this bizarre, angry, somewhat hate-filled old man. Well, the reason why I was bringing him up is after the events of 9-11, there was an OVW show where Jim Cornette essentially was given a live mic and decided to say what he felt about the whole situation. And I've, I've never heard about this. I'm very surprised. <laughs> well, he says something to the effect in the, in the promo that he delivers. He says something along the lines of, uh, in a war, innocent civilians are going to get killed, and it's going to be better. To, it's well, it, it's better that it's going to be theirs instead of ours. That type of thing. So he's basically uses the platform he has to call for a war effort, and 
basically talk about the fact that even if though it's going to lead to the death of innocence, as long as it's there, it doesn't matter as much. Okay, well, to be fair, that's not the worst thing we heard because Brad. Trump no, it's it's, it's, not, it's not it's not it's not the worst thing, but it it again shows what the the rhetoric was at the time, and people were given the platform to try and call for the deaths of people over the actions. Again, emotions running high. We know we've discussed this at length in our in the previous episode, but it's can, still. But it's crazy because imagine if like people would have had that kind of platform for like World War Two. Like people would, you'd hear so much crazy shit. But I I think it's just like the benefit of hindsight allowed you to go, well, geez, Jimmy, maybe you shouldn't be calling for the death of innocents. Oh yeah, I know. It, it's a case of like trying to learn from those situations though yeah because if you, if you don't learn from them and you don't take something from what people are saying in those times then you're doomed to repeat them which yeah. i'm sure i'm certain sure many people would do now if a certain atrocity like that was to take place in a heartbeat i'm sure but the other thing that i want to take from an ovw show an ovw show was well it wasn't actually an ovw show it was a raw dark match where we saw a biz- well, what nowadays would be considered quite a bizarre sight for people that weren't familiar at the time, but in a tag team title match, it was Brock Lesnar and Shelton Benjamin teaming up to defeat the incumbent champions at the time, which were Rico Constantino, who would right. have his name shortened to Rito, Rico, and a Prototype, also known as John Cena. So... John Cena, he has said that Rico is actually like his first mentor in wrestling, which is wild when you think about what you know of them as major stars. I'm genuinely sad that we never got the tag team of Benjamin and Brock on TV. No, I can only imagine they were great. It's it's interesting that like nowadays, what in the last couple of months actually, there's been callbacks to how Benjamin and Brock Lesnar are linked. With Benjamin att- like getting attacked by Kane Velasquez and attacking Rey Mysterio recently, and I think there was a segment earlier where a uh, segment earlier in the year where uh, Seth Rollins and Shelton Benjamin had a match against each other. So ne- they're now all the way in 2019, 18 years after this happened, finally bringing up the relationship between Shelton Benjamin and Brock Lesnar and using it in the storylines. Yep, and I hope like one day if Brock was to ever. Be on TV, like I think that'd be a cool match for Velasquez and Mysterio in Mexico to do Brock and Benjamin against Mysterio and Velasquez. So let's talk a little bit about the uh, an end of a streak, not the Undertaker streak or Goldberg streak, but the end of the Madison Square Garden sellout streak. So previously, uh, Madison Square Garden had sold out a total of eighteen consecutive WWF shows. Uh, stretching back to uh, 1998. They had sold out Madison Square Garden every time until October the 14th, 2001. Uh, amazingly, this show was uh, main evented by a match between The Rock and Steve Austin in a title unification match. Because by this point, Rock was still WCW champion, Austin was WWF champion again. Uh, but, yeah, just it was. I think that's as clear, as clear a sign as any. With the two hottest stars in wrestling at the time, and they didn't sell out their home's arena, as it were, it's probably quite a clear sign that wrestling was on the the downturn. Well, I think they would sold out the arena had Austin not been presented like such a bitch in the last few months. Potentially, I mean, obviously having Austin as the heel and not a very, and business just going into a downturn anyway. I, it, it almost certainly wasn't going to sell out, but it just seems like a, a strong encapsulation of the way that wrestling was on the slide at this point in time. Because a few months later in January, Hunter comes back in the garden, and that place blows. Probably the loudest pop he ever gets. And like oh, yeah. wrestling was still hot. It just wasn't like, oh my god, I'm not going to pay a rent because I had to see wrestling. Yeah, I, I, yeah, I'd imagine that would be the case. I'm not saying that just because they didn't sell out one Madison Square Garden show that it was the end of pro wrestling. It just feels a bit. It, it feels fitting that 2001 is the year that streak does end. Yeah, well, 2001. It's again, it's a monumental year. 
Do they sell Madison Square Garden out now? I guess I mean I mean it's a it's more of a challenge now. I'd imagine. I don't think I they mean, do. That's why that's why I'm asking. Well, like, I don't. Well, think... I, th- I think the only I think the only reason they would sell out Madison Square Garden now is because they don't go there very often. So like they go there once a year at most, maybe once every two years. I think they go twice a year. They go for they do a Mania show and then the day after Christmas, and then that's yeah, they, it. and they don't use it for big shows anymore because it's not well. At least for pay per views, especially for your WrestleManias and stuff like that, it's not big enough. Which is a shame, but you know, I think this is the beginning because especially we're about to hit the era of WWF returning to domes for Mania. Like AT is going to be the Sky Dome. Um, AT does the nineteenth at uh, Seiko Field. Like we're hitting the era of the Garden is passe for them anyway. But maybe this has something to do with it potentially yeah so let's move on past that into a little discussion about ratings as well we, we try not to cover them in too much detail because we we get enough of like the ratings war nowadays to really talk about at this point in time but it was odd that the main issue that at least Dave Meltzer in the Observer was um like witnessing due to the ratings was that their decline was due to the fact that they weren't connecting with audiences over 30 years old. <laughs> Which is bizarre when you think nowadays that I think the average age of the WWF viewer is, is somewhere between... Yeah, it's over 50. So it just goes to show that maybe, because this is about 20 years ago, that it was just... Maybe WWE is only keeping hold of the same people the that same were watching at this point. In time. <laughs> and, and some of them have just gotten... like Some of them over time have gone away because the viewership has been less and less but it's still the same people but i laugh at that because every week we hear well this show did great with 18 to 49 and i'm like yeah but that's a 30 year gap they better be doing well within a 30 year gap that's encompassing a lot of people well yeah and i think uh i was listening to the observer recent like the observer radio recently and melts was talking about the fact that most of wwf's audience in that bracket steers towards the 40 and over range That's so weird whereas on AEW side of things it's under 39 which is still like it's still like pretty short whatever but it just means that maybe in four or five years time those people that are in that bracket for the WWE aren't in that bracket anymore and they're in the next bracket over whereas those in AEWs might still be there if people are still watching obviously uh, it's so strange to me that I think WWE and wrestling in general just genuinely seems to be touching the same people over and over and over again. And is there anybody really new that's coming into the fold? You know, like, those are the questions I have. Uh, There must be still some, but I just, I don't think it's as prevalent as it used to be. Again, WWE is not, or pro wrestling in general, is not the, the hip thing that it was back in the 1980s or in the boom period of the Attitude Era. That's true. Until then, we're still seeing... Like the fan groups just being pretty much the same group of people. It's let's let's face it, we're not going to shy away from it. WWE and pro wrestling in general is nerd culture. Yeah, and that absolutely is. And it's very, it's it's hard to really for them to reach the same level of popularity that it was during those times, especially nowadays. Maybe it will again, but at the moment, it definitely isn't. It's. It's a it's a small percentage of the population in every country that you live in. Can you imagine if the niche culture we have now existed in 2001? And in 2001, you could say, well, I'm not going to listen to the radio. I'm just going to listen to this NSYNC playlist I have on Spotify. Like, the entire culture would be different because you can literally pick and choose your own entertainment. You're not a slave to anything. No. no, especially at this point in time when TV was still the be or end all type thing, the internet was still in its, I want to say in its infancy, but it was still very much in a development stage. Yeah. Nowadays, you have so much stuff that's on demand, have social media, have so many platforms where you can choose your own entertainment, like you say. So it's hard for something to stand out in the same way that WWE did at this point in time or any major television programming was. So, move on past that now to... Let's talk a little bit about the XWF. <laughs> okay. How, how familiar are you with the XWF? I know Dennis Rodman was there. 
for a, a brief period, yeah. And like, I, I think this is like Hulk Hogan's weird, it's like a weird offshoot of ECW, but also got a little bit of like the Hogan stuff going on. I don't know. It's a very weird promotion in my eyes. It was, it was odd. Essentially, there, there's been so much discussion that was talking about this stuff in the, um, like, early, two thousand, early 2001 times. So, basically, I've been, when I've been reading through the Observers to get all of the um, notes for this stuff, a lot of it was to, due to, there was a lot of discussions going on between Universal and Hulk Hogan in order to try and launch a new promotion. Because Hulk Hogan, his contract with Time Warner expired actually quite soon after 2001. He'd already been let go from WCW due to the um, the incident with Vince Russo. That that famous stuff with uh, Bash at the Beach. That's um, right, because that happened in 2000 and he was in WWF by 2002, so I'm sure he probably could have made it in for the cut, for the uh, invasion. Oh yeah, I almost certainly could have done. But so I, I basically every single week that I've been reading the observers, there's been a little tidbit talking about how those discussions are going, like if they've stalled, how they're progressing, what ideas they're coming to the forefront. And I've not really mentioned it because at the end of the day, nothing happened until this point. And even when this did happen, Hulk Hogan was involved only to a slight degree. So it was just what what essentially it ended up being was an attempt to try and compete with. Uh, WWF with people that were previously in ECW or WCW and it ended up being run by Jimmy Hart and Brian Nobbs of Nasty Boys as kind of the the head bookers or the head talent. What the? <laughs> Brian Nobbs of the Nasty Boys? Well, he was friends with um, Hulk Hogan. I know that they're close friends, but why, why is he a uh, booker? Uh, because he was just one of the people that wanted to take it on. Like, not as far as like in terms of interest for running a new promotion, it wasn't as there weren't that many people as avid to do this, to do it as you might expect there to be. Yeah, um, which actually that is a little surprising because it's still hot enough, you know. Like we're gonna see with WWA, which is essentially uh, precursor to TNA. You, the desire is there. Yeah. But this was meant to be a precursor to, well, it's a precursor, like you said, to TNA and stuff like that. But it was originally meant to be a universal, a universal produced PG thirteen wrestling product. So they wanted to present it in the same way that WCW was before the NWO started. You know that's, when that, that's when ratings, idea. yeah, when ratings were pretty low and the company wasn't didn't reach the hottest streak in its entire time. But and they wanted, literally, they, there's jokes every day made about the Dungeon of Doom. I think it was the idea they wanted to differentiate themselves from WWF, which was obviously still in the TV14 uh, like bracket. So they thought to differentiate themselves, they had to go more PG. And it ended up being like a failure, as you'd imagine. No. Uh, so... The, they did uh, some tapings in November of 2001, which is why we're going to talk about it in a little more detail in our next month. But I just wanted to like lay the foundation a little bit because the main storyline that they decide to run during these tapings that they do is a power struggle between the company CEO, or TV CEO, which was Rina Mero, otherwise known as Sable. What? Yeah. What? And does, the, does footage and... of this exist? Oh... <laughs> You, yes, through um, a DVD that they released in uh, 2005 called uh, In Your Face, The Lost Episodes of the XFW. XWF, sorry. Show. I think I might have to look into this. Oh, it's on YouTube. I've watched it already. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, that's where I got them. Um, I, I could only promise people that we were going to report on stuff that I know I could find. So I'd already dug this up and I knew that those uh, episodes were on YouTube. So if you guys want to get some like early watching in on it before we do next month's episode, then go straight ahead into it. It's easy enough to find. And so it was between Sable and Roddy Piper, who was the babyface commissioner. And then I think uh, like during the things, you see Hulk Hogan has one match, but it's not even on the tapings. It's a, it's a dark match which I, with uh, Kurt Henning. 
which I believe is on one of Hulk Hogan's like DVDs that he released in the mid two thousands when he came back to be in the Hall of Fame. Amazing. Uh, there was a few other like famous people that were previously of the of this sort of time. So you had Greg Valentine wrestling on these shows, Buff Bagwell, AJ Styles, Chris Daniels, the Nasty Boys, LOD were on this. Uh, Kid Cash, Juventud Guerrero, Conan, uh, Norman Smiley. You know, without context, this is a fucking hell of a lineup. You got Sable, Roddy Piper, Daniels, Styles, LOD. Like, if you just say these names without any context, it sounds cool. So, obviously, it was founded in 2001. You had uh, Gene Oakland as one of the uh, hosts as well, like more, like the main announcer and stuff. But ended up only going defunct in 2011. Obviously, after many, many, like, months and years of it not taking place in any sort of tapings or show, house shows taking place. I believe, I think the last actual shows ended up taking place in around about 2008, 2009, but they didn't, they didn't officially call it defunct until 2011. Uh, do you want to have a guess at some of the, uh, well, I don't know if you'll be able to guess any of these because they're a little bit like all over the place, but the final XFW champ- XWF champions. I keep saying XFW for some reason. XWF champions. So Shane, Shane Douglas is world champ. No, the world champ was actually Viscera. Was the final champion. Okay. Uh, tag team champions. Uh. Let me, let, I'll give you a clue. One of them had a bit of power in the company. So, I, th- I was going to say the Nasty Boys. Yeah, they were the last ex-WF champions. Uh, Final Cruiserweight champion. Um, former WWE the... Cruiserweight champion. Oh, is it X-Pac? No, Kid Cash. Oh, okay. And the XWF women's champion was Christy Ricky. Ah, huh, one name that I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Well, she's um currently westling for... She's known as Glory, who who uh, wrestled Is she for on Wow. No, she actually wrestled for um, Wrestlelicious. Do you remember that promotion? Wrestlelicious is amazing, or was amazing, I should say. A promotion card with a, a guy who won the lottery and immediately, well, almost soon after this uh, announcing this promotion, pretty much went bankrupt. And uh, I guess it's also what happens when you give Jimmy Hart. Too much power to write music. <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, he he had too much power in this show, show as well, and that didn't work either. So, <laughs> so yeah, we'll talk a little bit more about those uh, tapings. We won't do like a full breakdown review because there's like there's three sets of tapings, and they're all about. I think every part of the DVD is about an hour long, so we'll probably just do a bit of an overview of what was good about it, what was bad about it. So have that to look forward to next month. But now I want. Uh... Survivor Series matches. Okay, I, I want to transition over now because there's a lot, a lot of sad news that takes place in October. What? Oh, come on. So I know, I know, it's depressing that we have to do this type of thing, but I want to try and get it all out of the way in one hit before we liven up the mood a little bit towards the end of this segment. Yeah, okay. take rough with the smooth, especially in professional wrestling. Uh, so let's start with uh Russ Haas who was the uh, brother of Charlie Hoss, also the tag team partner. They were both wrestling in the WWF developmental territory at this time. Uh, he suffers a heart, t- a heart attack in late September, which was obviously first reported in like, early October. Mm. Uh, and then he, before uh, passing away in uh, December, at the age of only 27. It was, um, so yeah, that's obviously a devastating death impression wrestling it meant it caused a lot of what you'd call like shock because they just weren't expecting it from someone like him who was very young and still just getting started in the business and it it caused a lot of a lot of like little um innovations to take place in terms of the way they screened wrestlers for um heart illnesses because they didn't expect that a guy like russ who was only 27 at the time to suffer a heart attack so it meant that they took a lot more a, lo- a lot more time and effort in testing people for those kind of conditions that's pretty much our age yeah exactly and yeah so 
you can't say that it's a good thing. It's one of those, well, not, it's definitely not a good thing, but it's a case of at least they learned from that and they took better precautions off the back of it. But it, it's always sad that it always has to take something like this to happen to encourage people to actually do those sort of actions. So Charlie Hoss, I believe, wrestled uh, for the next couple of months under the name, not as Russ Haas, but he added the name Russ to his name. And I, he used to wrestle with um, like an RH on, I don't know what part of his attire, but he it always had those initials on some part of his attire from that point onwards to pay tribute to his brother. Mm. And this is something I learned later, because obviously my first introduction to Haas was through Team Angle, but that it's shocking now, and it's even more shocking knowing how young he was when, again, like, I can't imagine having a heart attack tomorrow, you know? No. Uh, move on to that. So let's get even more depressing. The death of gentleman Chris Adams. Oh man, we've already discussed this in when we talked about him being un- like being convicted for manslaughter. You know, due to the um, death of his uh, girlfriend due to a drug overdose. Uh, so his death actually took place. Well, it occurred because of a um a bar fight. Essentially, with one of his friends, and they just got too drunk and started getting boisterous boisterous to each other and it ended up with the friend shooting Adams. Uh, This sucks. Yeah. Oh yeah, it's obviously Chris Adams was a pretty prominent member of WCW and a few other uh, promotions in the past. Uh, British wrestler. So, shot, shot and killed. I believe the friend did not face any jail time over it because it I believe he was it was viewed as uh, him acting in self defense due to the fight that was taking place between the two of them. So, but yeah, that sucks as well. And Chris Adams is a guy I got to know through DVD collections called The Superstars of Wrestling, and it was the early years of Steve Austin. And obviously, Adams trained Austin, and they had quite the rivalry in Austin's early days, and he's somebody that you knew, like, at the time, okay, there are guys that are quicker and are better today, but, like, you could see, but he could hang, you know, in any setting in 2004, and probably still today, if you put his style of wrestling out there. Absolutely. Even more uh, depressing news, Helen Hart. So, she suffered from multiple seizures during the month of October, which oh. caused her to end up in a coma uh, during until uh, until through, through to November. This was at a time where Bret Hart was doing a lot of promotional work for the WWA show, which we'll obviously talk about later. And so, he had to be on kind of standby, really, because he wanted to make sure that his mother was okay. Uh, Stu Hart was with her, like, by her bedside pretty much every day throughout her illness and then uh tragically she'd pass away on uh, the 4th of november 2001 this poor woman probably yeah. lived a life that you could write fairy tales about mm. and suffered a lot of tragedy towards the end of it that really sucks yeah the uh, matriarch of the whole family uh I can't, i'm trying to remember that how many kids she ended up having. I think it was close to about... It was over a dozen, I believe. She had... I believe there was 12, but a lot of them went. At least two or three that I know of went, tragically, including, obviously, Owen. And this is only six months before yeah. Bulldog. Like, this is... That, that family, man, my heart breaks for them when you really think about what they've gone through. Yeah, so Stu and Helen had 12 children between them. Uh, so yeah, I think um, Stu Hart ended up passing away pretty shortly afterwards. I think maybe a, like less than a year He lasted after. two years now. Oh, he lasted died two years in, He died in 03. Okay. But yeah, that's awful. Yes. Yeah, it's a, it was another tragedy for the Hart family. A family that suffered far too many, I probably would say. Um... 
then the final bit of bad news before we try and liven the atmosphere a little bit more is the career ending injury of Hayabusa. This sucks too, man. So Hayabusa, for those that aren't too aware of him, was a pretty f- well fam- very famous uh, Japanese wrestler, uh, contributed mainly to the Frontier Martial Arts Wrestling promotion uh, in Japan, FMW, where he was pretty much their franchise player between 95 and 2001. Uh, so what happened was, I guess it's fairly innocuous nowadays, considering how often we've seen Chris Jericho perform the Lion's Soul, where he, High Booster attempts the Cabrada, the Lion's Soul, uh, slips on the middle rope as he's about to t- attempt to do it, so he doesn't get a full rotation, and so he ends up landing on the back of his neck as he's trying to go over. And he's immediately paralysed due to breaking his neck in two places. What I think of immediately is the botch that I'm sure we've all seen with Jeff Hardy doing this. Mm. And wow. Yeah, it just it awful. just shows how bad it shows how badly these things can go wrong. So Hayabusa, who'd previously turned down moves to both New Japan and WWF over the years to in order to stay and be a big part of FMW's growth. Uh, so it ca- it, his injury uh, cracked two vertebrae after performing the move, left him wheelchair-bound until the, uh, 2015, where he um, regained some ability to walk by after being supported by a cane. I think there's that, a, um, that was awesome. Awesome yeah, moment. Yeah, there's a cool video on um, uh, YouTube of High Boost, of, like, just eventually surrounded by tons of wrestling legends being supported on his way to the ring. Uh, walking to a cat, walking through with a cane. Uh, essentially, once he went down as an injury, FMW pretty much folded almost immediately. I think they lasted until two thousand two until they were revived later on. It, it's uh, it, it now still exists as its own promotion. It just uh, I think it was defunct for about eight, maybe a, maybe a decade or so before coming back to surface with Higher Booster as one of the people behind the scenes. And he passed away at the age uh, in 2016 at the age of 47 after suffering a um, cerebral hemorrhage. Oh. Uh, he's uh, credited with in- innovating both the uh, Falcon's Arrow and the uh, Phoenix Flash. Well, both As... get regularly used by one WWE Universal Champion, Seth Rollins. Yeah, he's also uh, known for popularizing the 450 Splash. He didn't invent 450 Splash, but he was the one that kind of brought it to the forefront with. More, and more people used it following uh, Hayabusa's uh, take on it. So, yeah, it's a, a tragedy that a guy who had such a strong Lucha Libre influence was really bringing that into Japanese wrestling, just uh, had to, his career had to end like that so prematurely. Uh, he's one of my favorite, uh, my first real favorite Japanese guys, him, Sasuke, Liger, like, I always enjoyed that magical style, really. Yeah, it was very different than a lot of what, especially in New Japan, was showing at the time. So that's the end of the. So if you're so if now if you've just come down from a really low point, you're just about to reach for the alcohol, or whatever, to try and numb the pain. We're we're, we're done with that uh, that bad stuff now. Yeah, we can move. I mean, if you guys like wrestling and you're watching and you're listening to us. You're hoping for some good times. We're sorry that every month in 2001 seems to just be dreadfully painful at some point. Well, yeah, it's it's an unfortunate time in professional wrestling where you have to, you have to again. Wrestling is never always easy. You always take the rough with the smooth, especially at this point in time in the Attitude Era, like post Attitude Era times. But we we just want to try and give the most realistic and fair and accurate account of what stuff was taking place during these point in times. We want to leave no stone unturned, really. Uh, so, move on from the, the dark stuff into a few lighter bits of news. Kurt Angle's book is released in uh, 2000, in, in October of 2001. Uh, so, his first autobiography, It's True, It's True. Uh, essentially, this was, again, a wwf promoted book in order to jump on the fact of the success of Mick Foley's book and China's book that come out in the previous uh, couple of months. So, general impression of the book was it kind of exposed, I don't want to say exposed, but showed how confident that Kurt Angle was in his own abilities. 
So he had a full inherent belief within himself that nobody could touch him on an amateur or professional wrestling level. He spoke constantly throughout the book about how he thought that he was the best. If he set his mind to it, then he could be the best at anything that he wanted to do on a wrestling uh, level. Talks about the death of his um, father, who struggled with alcohol abuse. But the fact that he had to grow up with a lot of older brothers, and so he would... They were all good athletes, but Angle, due to the fact that he was the youngest of them, thought that he could had to prove himself a little bit more than the others, and said that due to that drive within him, in order to push himself beyond his brothers, that led to him being as successful as he was, both in like national championships, the Olympics, transitioning over into the WWF and succeeding. Um, so it talks a lot about how Angle was at the Olympics, what like basically what he took place at that point in time, what his training regimes were, his uh introduction to the WWF and what stuff was going on. It's not viewed as like the same level of regard as Mick Foley's books because Mick Foley was a better writer than Kurt Angle was, even though Kurt Angle got a lot of them. Um, his uh, book was ghostwritten as well, so he got a bit of support at that point in time. But it's a little bit more, I guess, clinical. It doesn't have the same sort of personality attached to it. It makes Angle seem pretty full of himself, or at least supremely confident in his own abilities, which some people might be turned off by. But at least it has some sort of interesting stories and interesting memories about Kurt Angle's history with his father, history with his family. His, uh, the murder of his uh, wrestling trainer, Dave Schultz, because uh, I think he was killed in the um, like 1980s, 1990s, something like that. How he, basically how every time Angle apparently came back from travelling overseas to America, he'd always kiss the ground as he came back, which I think is, again, showing this level of patriotism, which is pretty weird, but it's kind of defined his wrestling persona. But if it anybody just... should be a patriot, it's the dude who won a gold medal for our country in the Olympics. Oh, that's true. Like, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with being patriotic. It's just I, I, I don't, I don't call myself like a major patriot of the UK because there's a lot of shit going on, which makes me kind of not want to be. Oh no, no, no! But... Like, like today, patriotism doesn't exist in America today because, like you say, a lot of shit's going on. People are more wise and stuff like that doesn't exist but I, I was thinking about that not that long ago that when i was growing up i don't know if it's because i'm a wrestling fan or if it's because i was really young when 9-11 happened but like you used to regularly hear usa you don't hear that now <laughs> like let's no. be clear you do not hear that no i think there's a, a lot more appreciation for a globalization of the world which I think overall is a good thing, because it makes it, especially with the USA chants they used to do in wrestling shows and stuff like that, it came, it's, nowadays, you look through it back with 2019 eyes, and it's a bit xenophobic, oh, yeah. in the in the lightest sense of the world. Not that there's anything wrong with being patriotic about your country or anything like that, and I don't think everyone who chants it thinks that, oh, USA is either better than anything or is, like, wildly superior to any other country. It's just, now it, there's less emphasis on that, and I think that's probably a better thing than a bad thing. I would agree. So yeah, that's Kurt Angle's book. Uh, I wouldn't recommend checking it out, to be honest. it's I, I prefer one which was written through Kurt Angle's eyes nowadays, because obviously he's had such a much a longer wrestling career, because this was released, Angle's only been in the business two years at this point. And, so, and I, I would also advise that the early WWF books weren't a great representation of any... No, only for, only, Fo only Foley's ones really stood out from the pack. Yeah. Uh, let's talk a little bit about a documentary that was being produced by the Learning Channel called Body Slam, The Making of a Professional Wrestler. And essentially it was a look into the independent circuit and uh, through the eyes of four uh, wrestlers who were trying to break into, like, the WWF. Uh, so the four wrestlers that were kind of, uh, I guess, highlighted through this series were Christopher Daniels, uh, I've seen this. Big John Heidenreich, 
<laughs> Durs and McBee, McBee, and Mikey Henderson. So Christopher Daniels, we all know Christopher Daniels, still wrestling to this very day with AEW as part of a SoCal Uncensored. Which is amazing. At this point in time, he was considered to be like the 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 top star on the independent circuit, or at least like one of the top stars that had I, never ever wrestled in WWE. I think that's fair. He was already almost a ten year veteran by this point because he'd started wrestling in nineteen ninety three. That's insane, but yeah, yeah. So it's a guy who's nearly been wrestling for thirty years at this point. Uh, so big John so, Heidenreich, huh? <laughs> yeah, John Heidenreich, who. Uh, Obviously wrestled for WWE for a number of years as the poet who sodomized Michael Cole in a bathroom store. <laughs> and, and the more often forgotten, before he got linked with Paul Heyman, he was just John Heidenreich. And he kept insisting on his friend Little Johnny, which was yeah. uh, never proven, but rumored to be his penis. Ah, uh, right. I assumed he might have just been a cousin of uh, Little Jimmy. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, so, uh, Henderson essentially just was a constant, independent guy, so he wrestled on the circuit until retiring in the in uh, 2011. Doesn't be was the wife of former American gladiator Malibu. Do we was... know Malibu as anything else? Ah. Uh... I don't know if he was actually in any way like in the wrestling business. I think he might have just been a gladiator, like one of these American gladiators who was just a buff guy. I think he he, he he's featured on the series, so maybe he did do some wrestling on the side. But I can't I can't recall who he was off the top of my mind. But uh, McBee ended up dying in two thousand three of a heart attack. Yeah, uh, do not know what the cause of that was, but I can't imagine considering the fact that she was in her thirties that it was anything uh, positive. So, so essentially, the um series was built around the um like taking clips from the Ultimate Pro Wrestling promotion in California, which had a working relationship with WWF, and so a lot of WWF superstars featured on it or having in having matches on this promotion. So you see John Cena's on this, Samoa Joe's on it, or a Van Damme test, uh, and uh, the ultimate uh, pro wrestling promotion ended up closing in 2007. So, yeah, that's just a little brief overview of that series. So, just to be clear, Malibu was never within the wrestling industry, but has, like, several acting credits in movies like Batman Forever, Mortal Kombat, Annihilation. He's just a big buff dude that was probably used for some goon squad work or some stunt of war. Yeah, I'd, I'd pretty much learned that. I think that Gladiator's is probably his biggest claim to fame. Uh, talk a bit more about uh, TV series. The Weakest Link. So Love this show growing up. So uh, this show technically doesn't air until November, but they filmed it in October, so I think we can talk a little bit about it. So this was WWF appearing on The Weakest Link, which is a show which started in the UK, being hosted by Anne Robinson and transitioned over into America, with Anne Robinson still being the host. What uh, is she doing today, you know? I have no idea. I know The Weakest Link is not around anymore, so... That so, was like in a zeitgeist for a good minute, that you are The Weakest Link. Goodbye. Yeah, that is a... It, it was a great TV show, and uh, I'm surprised it, it's not still around, but I think it ended in the early 2010s. And I haven't heard anything of Anne Robinson since then. So, uh, but this edition was like a charity episode to raise money, mainly for um, mainly most of them were going for the uh, American Red Cross uh, Foundation due to the nine eleven attacks that happened recently, and so trying to give support to them. Uh, so the wrestlers that took place uh, that took in part in this were Triple H, Stephanie McMahon. Kurt Angle, William Regal, Trish Stratus, Lita, Booker T, and The Big Show. Now, one of the most uh, interesting, well, one of the, what I imagine a lot of people would take away from this uh, episode was how not smart Booker T is. <laughs> uh, he, he's not, he, he doesn't come, doesn't shine a great light on himself with some of his answers on these shows. Uh, same with Lita, Lita isn't, didn't come across the most intelligent. And surprisingly, Kurt Angle uh, kind of exposed himself as not being 
the sharpest tool in the shed either. I guess that's when he lost the three eyes and had to stick to the two he's got in his head. Yeah. Uh, William Regal came across very well and came across as very um, like oh. intelligent and well well read, but he was ended up being eliminated. In, I think he was the final man left outside of the two finalists, which surprisingly enough were Triple H and Stephanie McMahon. <laughs> That okay, that's a great final three. Um Yeah. See you can understand why Americans think British people are just naturally more well spoken, well read, more intelligent. And Booker T never claimed to be a scholar, but at least he got a WrestleMania match out of this. Oh yeah, of course. And uh you say on the lines of um that rock crime where he says, uh Booker T, what's two plus two? Thomas yeah, I... Jefferson sucker. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so end up with Triple H and Stephanie McMahon against each other in the um, final uh, run where Triple H ended up winning, defeating Stephanie McMahon to win the weakest link, win money for his charity. So yeah. it's also it was a fun show. The moment that Vince McMahon decided, okay, he beat her in an intelligence competition, he's good enough to marry her. Yeah. And uh, I, I believe there's one more WWF uh, on the week's link uh, the following year or a couple of years later. I can't remember who exactly was on that one, but I know it was none of these uh, eight did a repeat. So they chose eight other people. I think Kane was on the next one. He probably did well. Uh, yeah, I'd imagine so. Uh, but yeah, I, I um. I'd, I'd go check out that one as well because both uh, both of them I recall watching and both of them were pretty good. WW like E guys and you remember those um those TNA Family Fortune shows they did for a week. Yeah, yeah, th- they're pretty good shows. So the eight on the 2002 edition mm-hmm. were the Terry Runnels, Deborah, Ray, by the way, Dudley, Jerry Lawler, Devon Dudley. Kane, Edge, and Stone Cold Steve Austin. Yeah, I would. I wouldn't be surprised when you said Bed Brother if Stone Cold was on it as well at that point. So, yeah, it's uh, they got a fairly good run of people when WWF was still a pretty big deal. Get to appear on these shows. So, yeah. so yeah, that was a, just a little bit of fun. I'd, I'd urge people to check it out if you can find it on YouTube or Daily Motion or something like that. Uh. Let's move over away from the WWF and into New Japan. Oh, nowadays, one of our favourite promotions. At this point, they were hosting their 50th anniversary of Wrestling in Japan show at the uh, at the Tokyo Dome during October. With some of the matches include, I don't want to like break down the whole show, but some of the matches included the like sizable tag team of Giant Silver and Giant Singh. The, uh, the Great Carly. The Great Carly and Giant Silver teaming up in a two on four handicap match, defeating the team of Hiroshi Tanahashi, Wantaru Inoue, Kenzo Suzuki, and Yutaka Yoshi. So basically, you get these, just these two giant freak shows defeating four guys, one of which became like the biggest star in New Japan's history, potentially. <laughs> just uh, bizarre. So. I'm very sad that throughout this series, New Japan is just in the thick of their worst time period. Oh, it's it it gets a lot worse. We haven't even started the uh, Oh, we didn't touch on Anokiism, but I don't yeah. know if we will. <laughs> no, well, it's it it gets a lot worse, especially when the uh, the Brock Lesnar's of the world start diving into New Japan and causing a lot of trouble. But uh, at this point, it's only we've really only seen the start of the. The Dark Ages for New Japan. Uh, another match on this show, in order to try and celebrate the fact it's 50 years in wrestling in Japan, they brought back some old timers. So it was Bob Backlund teaming with Tatsumi Fujinami, who I believe Tatsumi Fujinami, I think he's going to be. Is he one of the people that's wrestling on he this sure Riker is. show? I know, it's 18 years after this, and he was already considered quite an old man at this point in time. I don't like know how Fujinami's wrestling, but then again, I've seen Dory Funk have, like, full-on matches at the age of 70-plus. Well, it's funny you should mention Dory Funk, because they were the people that Bob Backlund and Tatsumi <laughs> Fujinami were teaming. It was Dory Funk and Terry Funk. 
course. Yeah, so they decided to put that match on. And again, this is at a time when even at this point it was like, okay, how long are these guys going to still be wrestling? And most of these guys ended up wrestling in, well into the 2010s and all of that. So, you know, it's pretty uh, incredible, really. Like, Bob Backlund still seems to be in pretty decent shape for a guy of his age. So, who knows? We may not have... We definitely haven't seen the last of uh, Fujinami, so I wonder if any of the other guys will ever wrestle again, either. I, I think Bob Backlund could probably wrestle tomorrow. Yeah, I probably... I think does. Terry Funk is finally done. For real yeah. this time. And I'm sure Dory Funk could wrestle tomorrow as crazy as that sounds. Yeah. It just, it just seems pretty odd at the time. Like, in two thousand, <laughs> like just all the way back in 2001, people were thinking, okay, this must be just like, just throw a few old guys together, just give them a little bit of spotlight, and they were still wrestling multiple years later. Just I will say, this stuff. speaks to the in-ring style that that era represents being a much better and safer in-ring style, because you won't see the Young Bucks doing this 30 years from now. No, but I imagine we'll still see Rey Mysterio doing a few bits and pieces. <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I want to also talk about NWA. So NWA has got a bit of a... is now experiencing somewhat of a revival with the Power Show, which we've talked about on the uh, the mailbag recently. It's something that me and Rob are both big fans of. Love it. Uh, which also features Jim Cornette, but at least he's doing commentary and not having to do his uh, podcast where he's just moaning about and how he's people doing being commentary the at the end of the way. So obviously it's already like better. <laughs> oh yeah. So they had their 53rd anniversary show. Uh, it was a sad state of affair because it was only in front of 300 people, very much in the a low point in uh, the NWA's history. Uh, champion at the time was Steve Carino who was heading into a match defending that title against Shinya Hashimoto. So I just want to talk about it because it's quite like a bizarre instance that took place. So Karino bladed during the match and then apparently asked Hashimoto to kick him in the head to make the cut look worse. You know, just to do a little bit of hard way on top of the blading. And Hashimoto did this, but kicked Karino so hard that it ended up knocking Karino out. Yeah. So Carino was pretty much out on his feet, and so the referee decided to end the match. Now, this led to a whole issue with the fact that Hashimoto wasn't supposed to win this match. It was supposed to be a, a DQ for Hashimoto, leading to a rematch which would take place in November, that Carino would drop, uh, then drop the title to Hashimoto. So it led to the NWA board members at the time basically having an argument around the ring and in the ring to talk about who the champion should end up being. Because they just basically said, like, some people saying, oh, because the match ended in a knockout, Carino technically didn't lose the title by pinfall submission, so he should oh be the champion. God. And certain other people saying, well, Hashimoto was beaten him by knockout, so he should be the champion now. So I think essentially what they ended up doing was that the uh, the belt was pretty much held up for a little while. I think Carino dropped it on a random... It was basically viewed as the de facto champion, but ended up dropping it to some random guy on a... Uh, a, t a tour they were taking place in the UK and it, it just leads to a, a, a pretty confusing mess between all of it. it just, it's just a bizarre situation where due to like a match having to be stopped early because of a, a real life incident taking place in the ring it leads to basically everyone on the NWA board having to shout at each other about who the champion should not be. <laughs> um, the NWA is a mess and at least in today's world under Billy Corgan it seems to have some structure. Yeah. I mean, the show itself was deemed to be mostly a success outside of the main event, with um, AJ Styles and Christopher Daniels having a great match on the show, among several other people. And then after the show, uh, NWA president at the time, Howard Brody, got into a backstage fight with Bill Alfonso, of all people, who had uh, worked the match, worked, worked the show as a manager. Uh, despite the fact that he apparently hadn't been booked, and so we ju had just come out with to, alongside one of the wrestlers who had asked him to appear, and so when he came in asking to get paid, it ended up obviously Brody didn't want to pay him or agreed to pay him a reduced rate, but not pay him the full amount that uh, Alfonso was expecting, and so they get into a fight over it, and Alfonso gets kicked out as a result. You think he was blowing a whistle the whole way through? 
Uh, I'm pretty sure like Brody would have made him swallow that whistle if uh, they got into mm. a real fight. But uh, yeah, it just goes to show how some of the chaotic things that were taking place on the independent circuit at this point in time. Uh, speaking of which, uh, the final reheated tag we're going to talk about before we move on to our show reviews is the APW King of the Indies tournament. So King of the Indies, I don't know if that still takes place nowadays. It's kind of more just PWG now with their... Um... The King of the Indies is taking place... I, and I think it might actually still be APW, but yeah. it's it's obviously uh, to a much smaller scale. Like it's not. If you remember, the Super Eight used to be a big tournament. I think the big indie tournament that everybody pays attention to now, like you said, is the uh, PWG, the Bolo. Yeah, but yeah, Battle of the Angeles stuff is kind of now seems to be like where you see the top stars, the indies going up against each other. But um, so in this one, it took place between October 26th and 27th, 16 man tournament. So some of the names on the list I probably might mention because they don't really go anywhere beyond the independent circuit. But some of the names included uh, Doug, Doug Williams, uh, Adam Pierce, a multiple time NWA heavyweight champion, uh, Brian Kendrick, wrestling as Spanky at the time, uh, Super Dragon, who is. A, a very famous name on the PWG circuit. It's a very famous name, all right. Yeah, that meme that still exists in uh, yeah. wrestling lore. Christopher Daniels was on it, obviously, because he's everywhere in the independent circuit. Uh, Loki, Kazarian, uh, Samoa Joe, AJ Styles, and uh, the eventual winner, one Brian Danielson. Uh, Daniel Bryan, two people. That Brian won. Danielson, he was almost the NWA champion at one point, like. The NWA wanted to rebuild itself around Brian. And when you think about Brian, that's not that bad of an idea. Oh, no, of course not. But he ended up sticking mainly with Ring of Honor before eventually going to WWE and becoming a major success. Uh, as Well, as much, a lot of these guys have either come to either WWE or TNA or AEW and been a success as well. So it's just a nice little round off of this was what the future wrestling was looking at like at this time where these guys were wrestling on this big independent wrestling show and now all of them with the exception of pierce who only really wrestled i think for ring of honor and the nwa and never really went too much further than that and super dragon obviously but he's just an indie legend uh all the rest of them and now m- m- most of them are still wrestling and a lot of them wrestling for wwe or AEW, which is amazing and wrestling like you said, we, we talk about this so much every time we do this, but the timing in doing a 2001 retrospective this year is almost too perfect. So we move away now from the reheat tags. I hope you enjoyed them into our show reviews. Uh, but before we do that, let's just throw out a couple of plugs. So if you're following us on the YouTube channel, do feel free to leave your comments below about what you think about some of the stuff you're hearing, if you're enjoying the series so far. Any other thoughts or any insight that you can provide is all very useful. If you're listening to us through other like podcasting platforms, you can leave a like a little rating or review of what we've been doing so far. Then head on over to YouTube, subscribe to the channel, leave a like, leave a comment, anything we want to hear what you guys are talking about. Uh, you can also join the conversation on the Mega Maniacs Facebook group if you want to join that or follow Smart Count Moment on Facebook, on Twitter, or all the social media platforms that you can find us on. Yeah, and obviously check out all the uh, written stuff on the website because as long as alongside all the podcast stuff we've got going at the moment, there's obviously tons of written articles as well that you can check out, including all the weekly stuff, the power rankings that I write, the triple threat, uh, Battle of the Brands, all this kind uh... of stuff. Um, and we talked earlier about wrestling being very deep in nerd culture, and Tony's not here, but if you want to support our sister site, Fanboys Anonymous, you can do that by checking out fanboysanonymous.com and supporting that Patreon, which is patreon.com slash fanboysanonymous. So, move on to our first show review now, which is No Mercy 2001, taking place, uh, October 21st from the Savage Center in St. Louis, Missouri. Official attendance 15,647, 325,000 pay-per-view buys. A sharp drop from 2,550,000 buys. So, overall thoughts, 2001, no mercy? 
mixed bag. I'm surprised. I, I know, I'm totally surprised, but I I really really enjoyed the show. I thought this was the best show they've done since uh, since WrestleMania. I think the hindsight stuff for me ruins a lot of this. That's like, fair. Because you just go, God, but it's really good, but none of it matters. Like none of it that, would matter in a month. That, that I mean that that is fair. I think if you try and I can understand that point of view, and it can make it difficult to appreciate it. But I think if you try and divert that and one side thing, just try and watch the wrestling, which I tried to do to try and judge it by its own merits, I thought it was an excellent show. I would I would agree. It was a really good matches. This is the beginning of like all right, two thousand two and beyond has some really good wrestling, and you see it here. So has an opening video package surrounding the uh, WWF Championship Triple Threat. Uh, like the battle between the desperate man, Stone Cold Steve Austin, the vengeful man, Kurt Angle, and the confident man, RVD. We'll be battling over the WWF Championship, and we'll, we'll talk about it a little bit more when we get to the main event. First of all, you have to ask your thoughts about the uh, pay-per-view theme, uh, Saliva's Click click Boom. Um, you can think what you want about Saliva, but the odds are, if you grew up watching WWF in the 2000s, you're probably really big on saliva. I would be one of those people who is really big on saliva because of WWF. This was a really big time for saliva in WWF because uh, after this, they obviously do the theme for No Mercy 2001. They also do the theme for WrestleMania 18. And then I think they would do... Saliva Series 2002 as well. Yeah, so they would do at least one or two every year up until like 2010. Yeah, but they, they were pretty... Um part of the furniture for WWE for a long time. So we move on to the opening match, which is the Hardy Boys defending the WCW Tag Team Championships against La- Lance Storm and the Hurricane. The Hardy Boys are being accompanied by Lita. Lance Storm and the Hurricane are being accompanied by both Ivory and Mighty Molly. Why is Ivory there? Because she was hired by the Alliance to train the WCW girls at the time, which were Tori and uh, Stacy. So but, really, uh, it's like, well, Ivory's serious for a minute. Lance Storm is serious for a minute. Let's see how they gel together. Yeah, exactly. So I think they just wanted to try and give the WCW women's side some credibility in terms of actual wrestlers. That's fair. So JR talks about, in the build-up to this, that um, not so much for the match itself, but he, sa- he says that the triple threat match had been made a no-disqualification match which I thought was odd, considering the fact that every triple threat match should be a no-disqualification match. Isn't that kind of part of what being a triple yeah. threat match is? But yeah, I think it... it's weird, but even at this point in 2001, triple threats weren't necessarily what you... Like, you see a triple threat once every few weeks now. Mm. I don't think you were at that point. No, I actually think that the first triple threat match on WWF TV took place in about 98, I think. And I'm pretty sure one of the first um, triple threat matches in WWF history ended, on, ended in a count out, count out. <laughs> because, you know, they didn't have the actual rules for that laid out at the time. Because right. uh, cause the ECW were the innovators of the uh, freeway dance, which would eventually become the more familiar. Uh, even I think freeway dance is different because it's elimination. But I, I digress. We'll move on to the actual tag team match itself. Hurricane and Storm were a decent tag team. Yeah, I'm surprised they didn't stick with them and give them more of a playful name based on the fact that it's a Hurricane and Storm. There's a nice funny spot early on where uh, Storm goes for the tag for the Hurricane, but Hurricane holds out his fist instead because he wants a fist bump, and Storm just reluctantly gives it to him because Storm is the straight man of these two in the routine. It's just not nice little fun bits, and the Hardys are great, as they always are, in terms of just being daredevil tag team action. It was very good. All four, three, four of these guys are very athletic. I think Paul Heyman brings up in a commentary about the Hurricane used to wrestle with the Hardy Boys in the Carolina regions. Which is weird, because these are the kinds of things that weren't getting a lot of play back then. Mm. Uh, so, Hurricane avoids the poetry in motion, immediately rolls up Matt for a near fall, which I thought was a nice spot, you don't really see that. Considering how many times we've seen the Hardys do Whisper in the Wind, I've never seen that sort of spot where someone just dodges it and immediately tries to pin Matt Hardy in that position. So, you would think. You would think that would be a more logical thing to do. Yeah. 
everything just breaks down towards the end where Lita gets involved, thrown out by Ivory. Ivory gets uh, hit with Jeff Hardy's split leg leg drop thing. So obviously it doesn't affect her as much as it would affect um, one of the male wrestlers, I imagine. But it doesn't uh, matter because it's 2001 and hey, a woman got hit in the groin. Storm applies a half crab, but when he's got it locked in, Lita gets on the top rope, hits a uh, Lita Kamrana to take uh, him out. And then it's Twister Faye and the Swanton Bomb uh, to retain the title for the Hardy Boys. I thought it's for an, it's an opening match. It's supposed to be the most fun, one of the most fun, energetic matches on the card, and I think it really uh, achieved that goal. Uh, I will spoil something for next month. That next month's match featuring the Hardy Boys is one of my favorite tag team matches of all time. Yeah, well, we're definitely uh, look forward to that as well. It's some some good tag team matches at this point in time, as long as they end up involving uh, the Hardy Boys, the Dudley Boys, especially because Ed and Christian are now split up. So, but we'll move on now to backstage. RBD arrives. William Regal tells him that he should apologise to Austin, but RBD refuses because he's just looking out for number one. RBD was the cool. RBD was the top babyface at this point. Well, not top babyface because you had The Rock, obviously, and you had Jericho, but on the even though he was representing the alliance, he was the top baby face in the WWF championship match. RVD just turned heel in twenty nineteen. <laughs> yeah. And I look to the I, I say this now because I look to this moment of being like, Yeah, but even in 01, RVD was supposed to be a heel and he was over more than anybody on the roster. Like I I'm RVD cannot be a heel in my eyes. No, it it is surprising, but I guess if you're a veteran now in 2019, you can't do as much of the cool stuff as you used to be able to do. You kind of have to turn heel at this point in time to let your promo ability do the work for you. But uh, after that, Vincent Man arrives uh, with Michael Cole's there to interview him to ask him some questions about why he's there. They they do this funny thing where Cole puts the what goes to put the jacket on Vincent Man and he drops it. And so Vince McMahon answers his questions, but he puts it back on. And then Vince says, next time Cole drops his jacket, McMahon will drop him. So yeah. I thought that was clever because it's just like, even this is just a little stupid interview segment. And they put so much full and effort into it, it feels it's like, to try and make it funny. Yeah. yeah. I was just like, I bet they put more thought into this than they did that entire Roman Reigns, Eric Rowan feud. <laughs> that's, just, that's a fact. Yeah. So. Yeah, just changing times. Uh, had a match between Test and Kane, uh, which Two was of the very better big man. Yeah, definitely. And and this was, I'm not. It, it was clunky this match because these two are a bit, you know, they they're two powerful big men, and they were very athletic for the, their size, but they weren't exactly. They often needed someone who was a bit more polished to have really good matches. I'm not saying this match was bad by any stretch of imagination, but it was a bit. You know, botch laden, a little bit just punch each other rather than actually do anything too complicated. Which I guess yeah, is fine. Which, which is fine because look who's in the ring. Yeah, I, I don't mind a good, like, host match every now and again. It definitely breaks up the flow, especially after seeing such a high energetic, pretty much cruiserweight tag team match early on. This was a, a, a nice change of pace to keep things a little bit, like, give the f- fans something a little bit different. They did some nice power spots on each other with Tess doing a um, delayed vertical suplex on Kane. A, Kane at one point does a drop kick into a steel chair into Tess. Uh, Amazing. Had a, yeah, had a like Tess hitting the big boo, Kane kicking out of it. Kane hit a choke slam and then uh, Tess uh, kicked out of it because uh, Nick Patrick slightly delays with his count because Nick Patrick is the heel referee for WCW. Uh, keep continuity, even though I'm sure by this point it was all over the place. Yeah, well, it's just you never really like the heel referee who still counts. For, like, if you're a real heel referee, why aren't you fast counting for Test to win? That, that is true. Uh, there's got to be some decorum. I guess so. You've got to give the crowd what they want, I guess. So Kane misses a uh, diving clothesline. Test hits his pump out of handle slam for another two. There were a lot of near falls in this match, and the crowd was really getting into it, which I enjoy. Uh, Tess brings the chair in. Kane then grabs the chair. Patrick stops him. Uh, Kane then teases 
to choke slamming him, ends up getting low blowed and gets hit with the big boots, test gets the win. Uh so yeah, not pretty, but it was an effective match between two big guys, got test a victory. And after the match, Kane choke slams Nick Patrick to get a baby face pop at the end of it. He comes back, delivers another choke slam, and then does his like falling forward powerbomb move, which he I think he only really used in the early two thousands and stopped and retired pretty soon afterwards. Yeah, I never understood. Like in the video games, this was a finishing move for Kane for years, and I was like, he never did that outside of the Brothers of Destruction because that was like his version. Of the last ride. Yeah, it seemed like I was worried at how reckless that sort of move looked, especially doing it on a non wrestler like Nick Patrick. But it seemed to not cause, it didn't cause any real damage. Well, um, Patrick was a wrestler. Like, he, they wouldn't have done that if they didn't feel like he could take the bullet. No, of course not. So they did an interview segment where Coach tries to talk to Austin, but instead Deborah is there at the door, and you can hear everything that Austin is saying for Deborah to tell Coach. Which, again, it's, just, it's a funny segment. It's just a really funny interview where you hear Austin, everything Austin is saying. He's saying, telling Deborah to tell Coach that, so she tells it to Coach, but she gets rid of any of the profanity that Austin says. So any swear word, Deborah just says, like, if Austin says ass, she says but instead. That's, again, they were really... They were still invested in the character work. Like, it wasn't as ever-present as it would be in, like, 98, 99. But this is still some fun stuff. Yeah. Uh, Then we see Stacey Keebler walking uh, backstage, walking up to uh, Matt Hardy, wearing her robe. And she takes off the robe and asks uh, Hardy what he thinks of her lingerie. Uh, Hardy is pretty much slack-jawed and just stares at her when she walks away. Uh, eventually Lita comes up and he pretends that nothing happens to save face. Uh, they did those sort of things quite often, actually. Where Yeah, with the Hardys in particular. Yeah, because obviously, I think this was, it, it's effective. Obviously, it's something that you shouldn't do in 2019 nowadays, but it's effective in trying to make the go- like guys like the Hardys seem like heartthrobs. And I think it was also just to get that like cheap pop of, ooh, because... We could say what we want, but again, going to reference today's industry, the Lana angle has casuals talking. You know, yeah. a girl flipping the channels would be like, ooh, she's after her man. Like, I, It does work, even if we don't think it does as these like super wrestling nerds. No. And uh, the one thing I took away from this angle more than anything else is the fact that the boom operator just couldn't lift the microphone out of the shot. <laughs> <laughs> Like, like, come on, get some better staff, real. It's just probably his first and his last day. Yeah, which is it. Just it just makes it seem like because I assume what this segment's meant to show is it, like these guys aren't being filmed. It's just you know part of the illusion that we can just see this stuff backstage, and then you just see a boom mic dropping into the shot. It's like, oh wow, how staged all this stuff. Is. Yeah, not not great production value. No. But I will say, I remember one from an episode of Raw around the same time where Trish and Jeff Hardy were romantically linked on television, and Stacy just comes in with a paddle, and it leads to, like, a paddle on a pole match. And that, granted, like, this is not the way women should be presented. But again, considering the time period... There was no bigger female star in WWF for a while than Stacey Keebler. Like, she got to do quite a lot off the back of WWF. Yeah, absolutely. But, like we say nowadays, as we move on to this next match, probably a a typifying this kind of situation, which is the uh, lingerie match between Stacey Keebler and Tori Wilson. So, So, the video package is weird. Because, obviously, it's built around the breakdown in the friendship of Stacey and Tori. But then there's, you see the clip of Bubba Bubba Ray Dudley, because Stacey Keebler's now the Duchess of Dudley, Bill, the manager of the Dudley boys. Uh, Bubba Ray powerbombs Tori through a table. And I believe this happened about a week before this match. And Tori is just absolutely fine, not selling any injuries, any problem whatsoever with her back or her ribs or anything like that. She's just 
you know, just strutting around in her red lingerie. Well, now remember this. This is WF 2001. You got man on woman violence, which she got to sell for like a night. And then she still gets to come out on Sunday and be sexy. Business as usual, I'm sure. But tremendous lack of continuity. And I just complimented them for the Nick Patrick thing. Yeah, well, take the rough with the smooth, as it, as it were. And this match is rough. I mean, obviously, again, you get the you get the trying to like the male fans by having two women w- wrestle around in their lingerie, do a few like gyrations and and uh, pin attempts that are there to expose them in particular ways. Uh, they do the spot where they roll over the referee. Facey pulls out a whip and spanks Tori Wilson with it. <laughs> They do a head head scissor spot out of the corner, which the crowd pops big for because I assume <laughs> that you're meant to go with the assumption that oh wow, Tori's eating out Stacy on the screen. It's like oh, but... and then eventually Tori does this awful slow handspring elbow to obviously because she's dating to Jerry at the time. Like it's terrible, and she puts uh, Stacy in like the most compromising pin in predicament possible, where she spanks her pretty much while she's pinning her. And then, yeah, and the match is mercifully over at that point. All now, I'm gonna I was say confused is, while watching this because I thought lingerie matches were over once they were naked. Or not naked, but in their underwear. Uh, No, that was like a bra and panties match where they would rest coming with clothes. This was the first lingerie match where they would just wrestle in their lingerie. <laughs> yeah, so that's like, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, it, it, just a differentiation. I mean, they did <laughs> afterwards. They did lingerie pillow fights, and they did like fulfill your fantasy battle royals and stuff along those lines. It's all pretty much the same thing. It's just women in sexy outfits doing wrestling. So now that I'm older, fulfill your fantasy battle royal is the most creepy shit. Well, hey guys, cause... you get to vote on what these women are gonna wear for your well, entertainment. Well, it doesn't get creepy until you realise that the schoolgirl match almost always wins, and then you're just like, okay, so your fantasy is women who are underage. Yay! <laughs> oh, God. Uh, it, it's, I mean, it's gross, and, and this is gross. I mean, Thank OFAs... God we are at a point where women are headlining mania. Let me just... Yeah. Like, oh, yeah. It makes you feel better inside. Yeah, all I just have to say about this situation is what I always say with these matches that are taking place in 2001. There's plenty of good porn that you can find on the internet nowadays. Apparently, there's no like wrestling fans don't seem to get that. I know. There's no value. Like, at the end of the day, yes, there are many beautiful, very attractive women in WWF. But, you know, like, there's many beautiful, attractive women who do porn as well who will let you see all of that stuff. Yeah. So just watch that and let the women wrestle who want to wrestle. It's like, well yeah. Said. Just, yeah. Just you know this and this match like how much real titillation can you get out of two women in obviously two very attractive women in their lingerie but doing wrestling it's not like they weren't doing wrestling in this match they were trying their very best to do what they could do considering the fact that neither of them were trained well yeah but they got to see head scissor spots and you know your face ends up in the crotch and people pop for it which is weird because it's all it's all weird okay so um, we see Michael Cole interview Kurt Angle backstage, and Vince McMahon comes up, Angle he, like to wish Angle luck, but Angle says that he doesn't need luck, and he doesn't need Vince McMahon because basically the storyline being built up to it was that Vince McMahon seems to be trying to lure Vin- RVD to join the WWF. So reasonable idea when you consider the fact that they're going to lose Angle to the Alliance, which is it's funny because this match. Features three dudes that next month will be on Team Alliance. Yep. Yeah, just the changing nature of what WWF was at the time. Just a lot of parts going together, which didn't really make too much sense. Uh, We see Christian interviewed by Lillian Garcia. Gets uh, Christian talking about how he's the new star of the duo. And we move on to the Intercontinental Championship ladder match between Christian and Edge. And I'm going to be controversial here. This was my least favorite match of the night. This is one of those instances where two men 
enter in what is their signature match. So you expect it to be the greatest thing you've ever seen, and it just under delivers, maybe because of expectations. But I won't call it the worst match of the night, but it definitely under delivers. I mean, we've seen so many ladder matches in 2001. I think that's part of the issue. It's the fact that we've seen Chris Jericho against uh, Chris Benoit from Royal Rumble. We saw the TLC ladder match. We saw another TLC match at, um, was it, uh, an episode of SmackDown, that Fatal 4-Way one. We saw um, uh, RVD against Jeff Hardy at SummerSlam. And I think that was, it's just, there's so much... There's so much good stuff, and but it's kind of really repetitive. And these two, they don't seem to really go... Considering how crazy these two have gone in the multi-man uh, ladder matches, this is pretty pedestrian, all things considered. Yeah, and I think that was the issue with it. Edge and Christian tried to wrestle a ladder match more akin to Sean and Brett. And I think people wanted to see TLC, but in a singles match, and you can't do that when you don't have, when you probably have the two most methodical members of those six. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, there were two ladder matches that we're going to be reviewing, and this was the better of the two of them. <laughs> but. Yeah. Hoobie and Psychosis don't do it for you? They don't do a lot of things for me, let's put it that <laughs> way. But at the end, at the end of this. There was there was like a few high spots where you had um, an edgematic off the top of the ladder, Christian then doing his reverse DDT off both ladders. They both did this like crazy fall from the top of the ladder all the way down to the floor rather than like hitting the ropes or whatever. Then it ended up with a um that like recognizable spot where Christian is laying across two ladders and Edge hits the concerto on it on uh, Christian from that position. Christian slides off. Edge leans over, grabs the title, and reclaims the Intercontinental Championship from Christian. So it's not like it wasn't terrible, but it just it it's not a ladder match that would live long in the memory. Yeah, and I feel like 2001 has a few of these. I don't think RVD and Jeff Hardy, as much as you would think that ladder match is remembered, is remembered. I don't think, um, like the chain match earlier in the year with Hunter and Kane. That's not a remembered match. They were doing a lot of gimmick matches at the time that were just kind of falling by the wayside in history. So we see a shot of uh, Spike Dudley at the world talking about how he was uh, tossed through a... um, like legitimately tossed several feet in the air through a table by the Dudley boys. And that's why he wouldn't be wrestling with the big show for the uh, tag team title match which was taking place. But when Heyman talks about the fact that Molly Holly is no longer with him, he gets interrupted by this hot woman that comes up to him. And so, you know, just everything moves on. Just, yeah. just a segment. Very, very 2001. Yeah. Uh, which then leads into the actual World Tag Team title match, which is the uh, Dudley Boys versus the Big Show and Tajiri. So they come with a bit of a story with the idea that uh, the Dudleys put Tory Wilson through a table, you know, which would probably... It would feel more significant if Tori hadn't just spent like several minutes wrestling in her lingerie and winning a match pretty easily against Stacey Keebler. <laughs> like, oh yeah, oh I hate you because you injured my girlfriend who wrestled earlier and actually won her match, you know. But this was like this is a decent tag team match. I'm I'm becoming more and more of a huge fan of Tajiri every time I see him wrestle. Like he was so much better than he gets credit for. I I didn't, actually he probably gets a lot of credit, but only going back and watching all this stuff, you really remember just how good a wrestler he was. He's one of those guys that would have been huge today. He would have been monumental in the NXT era, the AEW era. Unfortunately, by the time you hit the big time TV, there was such a ceiling for guys of his skill level and size. Yeah, he just he didn't have the height at this point in time that the WWF was prioritizing over everything else. But he was still a popular guy. And for sure, yeah, and he definitely was the harder worker in his team because the big show gets the hot tag, does his like big man stuff because he can't do too much in the ring. Uh, Dudley's control most of the match over to Jerry. Rhino, uh, Jerry goes to miss one of the Dudleys, but he accidentally hits the referee by mistake. 
uh, show gets a choke slam on Bubba Ray and goes to the pin, but the referee's down, even though Big Show wasn't the legal man anyway. So that would be one of those instances where just logic went out the window. That's a very AEW style tag team match right there. <laughs> if the non-legal man is getting a pin. Yeah. Uh, uh, Rhino gets involved, takes down Big Show with a gore, and then Tajiri gets hit with the 3D and uh, Dudley Boy's retain. So, you know, just a tag team match, nothing really special, but it, it, I don't think it was as good as the first tag team match, but it's still not bad. We move on to, I think this is the first time we've seen uh, one of those Don't Try This at Home video packages that the WWF did for the early 2000s. Those videos for me are iconic, like, because they used to be unskippable at the start of every WWF DVD, so, mm-hmm. like, you eventually just get the verbiage memorized, and, you know, it it just becomes a part of the experience. Yeah, just, it just feels quite interesting that this is the first time we're seeing it, so this was, at, this is the moment when they decide that they don't want, uh, they don't want people trying their stuff at home. Fittingly, after, you know, hey, don't hit your friend in the head with a chair on a ladder and watch him fall to the ground. Yeah, no, it feels pretty redundant that they have to say that, but unfortunately they do. Yeah, uh, that's one of those things where, real quick, I know these are obviously important messages, but there it comes a point where, like, you shouldn't have to tell certain people not to try certain things. Okay, don't attempt a choke slam, sure. But don't attempt a ladder match? shouldn't be needed to say no no i understand that but i guess it might come down to somewhere psychology psychologically where people would be hit with steel chairs or be involved in ladder matches and whole core match and they would be wrestling the the very next week so people thought oh they can't hurt that badly because people do this and then they just but come it, back out immediately afterwards yeah because it's their own fault they people have gotten so into the but it's fake yeah like yeah the, People didn't get it. So we see Booker T getting a pep talk from uh, Shane McMahon and Test, and that leads on to his match with The Undertaker. So match is built around the idea that Booker T hasn't got the respect that he deserves since joining the WWF, and so he's going to try and beat the respect out of The Undertaker. This is another match that starts off with... This is a very like 2001 thing where matches start on the ramp or just with a beat down early on rather than you know actually starting with a lock-up that we see 99% of the time nowadays. Yeah, um, full disclosure, I forgot this match existed before I watched this card. Like, this is one of those things where, in theory, you say the names and you think, oh, this is a pretty big match, but it just skips the memory. Yeah, it just seems quite odd, especially with these two, because Undertaker and Booker T also had a match in 2004. Uh, Booker T was Undertaker's next opponent, pay-per-view opponent after coming back from... Like his dead, like dead man persona in uh, Judgment Day 2004. Day, yep. And nobody remembers that match. Either. Also, also very skippable to the memory. Yeah. So maybe it was just these two just didn't have the chemistry or just weren't, didn't, didn't feel important enough at the time for these matches to be considered big deals. So they fight around on the, uh, like outside for a little while, Undertaker does some of his submission specialist work by putting some arm bars on Booker T, because he's he's more than just a power guy now. Uh, he's an like an MMA fighter. Oh yeah, yeah, and he's, uh, he's tell him he's the real big dog. He's big evil. Yeah, he's the best pure striker in um the WWF, and also its best submission specialist as well. So yeah, well, no, I don't think he got to the the Google Plata for a time of his career yet, but man, Undertaker was just he was the best at this time. Yeah. It's amazing he was never champion. <laughs> well, um because he does a spinner rooney and now the crowd is starting to cheer when he does it, so the the spinner rooney's finally getting over as like Booker T's thing. He does a um a scissor kick when Undertaker's like hanging over the top rope to get him back into the ring. Uh and Undertaker I thought it was a nice touch that Undertaker had to put his foot on the bottom rope to, and he didn't actually kick out of it. So it just shows yeah. that it was, a, it was a little bit more powerful. Like, it was, it was enough that Undertaker didn't lose the match, but he didn't, ha- he couldn't kick out of it. Like, um, like a really... he, he didn't DDP him, you know what I mean? Like... Yeah. 
Yeah, it was, it, it, it's like a, lot, a shittier version of Okada putting his foot on the rope for the one wing danger. That type of thing. And then we potentially Booker makes the the ultimate fatal mistake when you're facing Undertaker, which is when you go for the 10 punches out of the corner. So Undertaker does what he does in that situation, which is get Booker T up for the last ride and pins him off the back of that. So, yep. so it, was, it was a decent match, nothing, but it just didn't have anything special and didn't have any emphasis behind it. Yeah, and this is the beginnings. Not the beginnings, because I think Booker T is in the Survivor Series match. But by December, January, Booker would be firmly planted in the mid card. Yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely would agree with that. So we have The Rock versus Chris Jericho for the WCW Championship. So this is this is the best match on the show. Eight, At least in okay. my mind. Okay, eight-year-old me loved this match. 26-year-old me still fucking loved this match. Rock and Jericho, because their feud was so... It, w- it was extended, but it was in such short bursts that I think it's often forgotten because they traded a lot of major wins on Raw. This rivalry was so much fun. This might very well be, and again, it covers a lot of ground, but this might be the most well-wrestled match of The Rock's career. Because Rock was awesome. awesome. Rock is awesome, but Rock was on another level in this match in terms of his wrestling ability because he's often kind of henpecked as like oh this he's obviously had tons of charisma but his wrestling sometimes left a bit to be desired and it was all punches and stuff like that but rock was on fire in this match and jericho very, was great as well very good match um, i love I, I something that i don't think that just doesn't go stated enough about rock's matches is his stare downs that he does at the beginning of matches just makes every match that he has feel so special. Yeah, this is a staple of Attitude Era Wrestling that, like, you don't see anymore. You don't see that thing where, all right, they're going to stare down and they're going to, you know, really talk shit. Like, like you kind of said, it's either they're going to lock up or if they really hate each other, they're just going to run and strike. Yeah. So, starts off with some solid chain wrestling between Jericho and Rock. And then eventually it ends with uh, Jericho slapping the rock and going to start brawling with them. The fans in this match seem to be more behind Jericho than the rock. Yeah. I think I think it's just because obviously Jericho is widely popular at the time as well, but it's also the fact that this was this was built around the idea that Jericho can't win the big one. So he was the underdog going into it. And when it's between two baby faces, you usually side with the underdog or the one that hasn't been champion. Yeah. Just because it feels better. Uh, there was like a great spinning heel kick by Jericho. At one point, The Rock does a superplex, which he doesn't, it would never often do. Rock gets like the heat on Jericho for a while by performing like a um, like put him in a headlock, the Randy Orton special for a while, and uh, Jericho does a like standing Hurricane Rana at some point, which I don't think he ever really did outside of his uh, cruiserweight work. Uh, Jericho hits a rock bottom at one point and does the lion soul and gets like a really long two count and then he he does the people's elbow or attempts to do the people's elbow but Rock gets up and puts uh, Jericho in the sharpshooter. Uh, then Rock puts uh, Jericho through the announce table because you always need to put someone through the announce table in 2001. <laughs> uh, then, then the best spot in the match, Rock goes to the people's elbow and then at, just at the point where he's uh, like got one leg in the air to to drop down, Jericho picks the other leg, gets him in the walls of Jericho, and the crowd is going absolutely insane at this point. The, is the walls of Jericho the most over submission move of all time? Uh, it's a great submission hold. I think the sharpshooter is up there. Yeah. But because Jericho is. Like, with the walls of Jericho, it was at a time where, you know, you would actually kind of fight the submissions a little bit. And, you know, reach for the ropes, drag to the middle, where with the sharpshooter, it was like, no, you're in it, and you tap five seconds later. I think that's what makes the Walls of Jericho the most over submission of all time. It just, like, there's, you can count on one hand 
uh, submissions that are as over as that. You'd probably be saying Jericho's balls of Jericho, Kurt Angle's ankle lock, uh, Bret Hart sharp shooter, Benoit's cross face. Probably, I, I don't know if there's anything else that really like holds up to that kind of level of like. As soon as it applies, the crowd just goes like wild. Yeah, especially now. I, it's weird because I think submission wrestling has grown a little bit, mm. but there's nothing to the effect of like instant pop. You know? Yeah. Then you have um, so Stephanie McMahon runs down and interferes while Jericho's got the rock in the water. Jericho and throws a chair in the ring. Jericho goes after her, but she just falls off the apron, which could have been pretty dangerous because it looked like she hit her head on the on the apron as going when she was going down. Uh, and then the rock hits the uh, rock bottom with Jericho. Oh no! Actually, actually, he doesn't. He just uh, takes him down. I'm confused because Stephanie starts cheering for the rock because she hates Jericho a lot more than the rock, and so the rock attacks her and hits her with the rock bottom instead. Because you know, man and woman violence is two thousand one. Two thousand one. Like Stephanie took every major finisher from the Attitude Era at least three times. Yeah. Uh, so Jericho takes advantage of the referee dealing with. Uh, uh, Stephanie to try and check her out and get her out of the ring to uh, hit the breakdown, which was a finisher that he quite he only really brought back in two thousand and one, which is essentially the skull it's crushing the skull finale. Yeah. yeah, I I like this move for Jericho, but I think this more so speaks to the WWF's and WWE today to this very day. If you're a submission guy and you're going to reach the upper echelon of the main event scene. You need a standing grapple finisher. Like yeah. they they don't let you just be the submission guy. Yeah, and it was also transitioning away from the line sort being a move that pinned people to being just more of a a move that was one of his big moves, but just wouldn't would never win matches really. But I think because the line salt did win quite a few matches, it still holds up. Like I wish he'd put more people away with the line salt today. So, does the breakdown onto the steel chair and pins The Rock to win the WCW World Championship. Looks like absolutely great match. Jericho grabs the title, starts taunting Stephanie with it because he's won the big one now. And then there's this great shot at the end where Jericho's celebrating on the corner. The Rock comes behind him holding the steel chair that Jericho used to win the match. He stands there and Jericho just drops down and looks at the rock and his eyes go wide because he's just terrified that he's going to get hit with a steel chair. Rock instead just locks eyes, hands in the steel chair, mouths off to him a little bit and then walks away. Yeah. Uh, yeah Great good... slow building heel turn, I would say. Yeah, and this was a a great match, great segment overall. I doubt that these two have had... I, I've watched a lot of great Jericho matches, a lot of great Jericho feuds, and a lot of great rock matches as well, but there was something about these two having just wicked chemistry with each other. I would agree. And I think, again, this is one of the better feuds of the era that gets no love and attention. So you move on to the main event, which was... I love the video package for the main event. Yes just building up the tension between Austin and RVD and the shots of RVD. First of all, frog splashing Kurt Angle and Stone Cold showing that RVD's on his side and he's going to help him win this match. To then RVD, after being berated by Austin and being thrown outside by Austin, then hits the frog splash on Austin to show that he is every man for himself. And then they build into this whole idea that RVD's getting the loudest crowd reaction when he comes out. He's definitely the person people want to see win this match. They do some spots early on where, like, RVD and Austin are on the same page trying to take out Angle, but then they eventually start breaking down and Austin starts beating up everyone. There was, like, a... um, There were loud what chants during this match. And I was, like, thinking, okay, this is where it starts. Because we haven't heard it as prominently in matches. But I assume, well, obviously, by this point in time, Austin's doing the what stuff quite often. And it's also, but it's still appropriate. Like, the way it's done, like when Austin hits the mud hole stopping, they're going, what, mm. what, 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 what? Like, at least it works. They're not being dicks and just going, I don't like this promo. What? What? I, I don't know. I got, 
I have feelings about the wet chants because I, I just think they're disrespectful. So we have a lot of Austin and Rob, and Austin and Angle brawling on the outside because that seems to be all they do in their matches. They didn't stay out there as long as they did in some of their previous matches. I think at one point Austin teases a pile driver on the announce table, but Angle lifts him over onto the, like back first onto the uh, announce table. Had RVD afterwards land a suicide dive onto Angle. And at this point, we see the man come down to ringside to try and watch everything that's going on. Uh, RVD goes up for a frog splash on Angle, but Angle does his um, patented run up the turnbuckle belly to belly suplex, which is one of his best spots. See, Austin does a few stunners, but Angle hits a stun on Angle, but Angle falls to the floor. Uh, Austin waits for RVD, but Vincent Man runs in, charges with a steel chair, and hits Austin in the back, which allows RVD to hit the five-star frog splash, but just before he gets to the free count, Angle's in to break it up. I think that probably really turned the crowd on Angle, because they really wanted to see RVD win. Yeah, and I'm surprised WWE never pulled the trigger with Van Damme. You can argue that they did, but it was clearly just more of a marketing ploy to get the revived ECW back over. But this dude was over as fuck, still is over as fuck. And they, it's just one of those things. He never got that recognition. So after RVD hits the splash, Angle then nails a lot of suplexes on RVD and hits him with the Angle Slam. But then Shane McMahon has run down to the ring and he breaks up the pinfall. Throws Angle to the outside to prevent him from doing anything. Rams him into the steel post. And then the most hilarious thing that I might have seen in wrestling in quite some time. Vince McMahon charges at Shane who runs backwards away from him. And they fall over the announce table. (laughs) I had to replay it like (laughs) ten times. It was so hilarious. Because Vince's eyes, that he's so angry. And Shane is just (laughs) pedaling back so quickly. And they just fall over the top of it. it's, the crowd goes crazy for it. That that was my favourite spot of the entire show. It was so oh, much fun. So, so good. Vince, Vince, say what you will about him nowadays in 2019, about his how his creativity and everything on those lines, but he's the, one of the greatest characters in wrestling history. I will argue that the McMahons, in their McMahon-based roles, do it better than anybody ever could because they're just so damn entertaining they're so over animated that it works Mm. it's 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 overdone especially nowadays when you kind of want something different but especially at that point on those guys just did stuff that they were willing to embarrass themselves and do and push the envelope further than pretty much anyone ever wanted would would do besides them and then we have the just basically just leads into Austin stun, stunning RVD pretty soon afterwards and pinning him to retain the championship. Well, McMahon just stares on seeing that Austin's still holding the title. So yeah, that was the um, a fun main event finish. It wasn't as good as the uh, match that preceded it, but it was still a fun triple threat match. And yeah, I think overall No Mercy was a thumbs up show. No Mercy was good. Uh, I can't recall if Rebellion is October or November. November. Okay, so we are watching that next month. I'd say we'll give it a bit of an illusion. Like maybe we'll we'll watch it, but uh, not going so so much detail when we're reviewing it because I think we kind of want to build all of next month around Survivor Series mainly because that is the big show. All right. Well, I think that those two shows go hand in hand quite nicely. You see. Um, Quite a lot of things are taking shape now. Like, this journey's almost over, you know? And by the time we do December as a wrap-up show, it's going to feel wildly different from what even this show feels like. Yeah. But I think this was the beginning of... The WWF will be fine. It won't be as fun, because there won't be direct competition. But look at this wealth of talent. It's going to be fine. Yeah, it's uh, they still have a lot of talent to be working with, which is great. But you, you can turn tell that everything is becoming quite consolidated and formulaic now because there's no competition. And part of the reason why there's no competition is because of our next show, 
which is uh, the final thing we'll be reviewing. But before we get into uh, World Wrestling All Stars Inception, to add a few, throw a few more plugs out there. So, if you would like to support us in a financial way, in order to make sure there's more shows like this, or request your own shows that you'd like us to do, whether it's a retro podcast or another exploration of some kind of wrestling history or just, I don't know, get us to rank, uh, I don't know, the gobbledygook as tires or something like that. I don't know. I think there's only <laughs> one, but you know, yeah, oh, yeah. I think what Cal is trying to say is if you donate to the Patreon for Smart Cut Moment, you can be directly hands-on with what we produce. Like, Marco this month donated 50, I don't know, it's $50, but he donated to the tier that he can pick his poison and he's elected that we do a Mount Rushmore comedy character. So that's going to be coming at you next week. Guest 5 has donated some and he's been able to dictate some of the content that we do in the past. If you like what we're doing, and I do, and I know Callum, I'm sure, is exhausted by the research, but he likes going back in time. If you want to see more of that, the best way to ensure that there is more of that is the Patreon. That way, we know that you're directly supporting us and we can take time away from our other ventures to do this for you, the loyal viewers and listeners of Smart Cat Moment. Absolutely. So, especially because I've seen a lot of people in the comments talk about how they want us to continue this into 2002 or to go back into a different period of time and dig into that. This The best way to spur me to continue doing the research and spur Rob who's already lo- front loaded with so much yes. wrestling to like take some time out of our schedules to do this is to donate to the Patreon or to buy a t-shirt or some other form of merchandise on the Red Bubble or Tea Public show Tea Public uh, stores. That way you also get to support us and you also get something in return immediately, which is a t shirt with a fancy slogan on it, whether it's the uh Biggie's package or uh Emma chewing and some Emma chewing gum or anything along those lines. Yeah, so that's a great way to support us. Obviously, as we mentioned earlier, support fanboys and others as well through the Patreon as well. Give Tony some, a reason to make some more geek uh, content. With uh, after you did that, uh, what was it, Batman? The Batman. So we've uh, done film. We've done two because yeah. again, Guest Five has donated to Patreon and has chosen the Pick Your Poison tier. We've done Batman: Mask of the Phantasm. We've done Batman and now Batman vs. Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And so it's very much the same. If you like that stuff, go check out Fanboys Anonymous. Go support Tony. Let him know that his continued efforts are all appreciated. And yeah, we'll keep delivering awesome content. Okay, so let's move on now to our final review. It's quite a long episode, this one, but there's a lot of stuff to cover this time. I'm going to go with The Inception from World Wrestling All-Stars at the Sydney Superdome in Sydney, Australia, taking place October 26, 2001, but not broadcast in the US until January the 6th, 2002. So a little bit of an insight into World Wrestling All-Stars, because I'm sure there's plenty of people listening that uh, aren't familiar with the promotion. So it was founded by Australian concert promoter Andrew McManus. And it was originally the idea of basically bringing something to life off the embers of the death of WCW and ECW with a lot of talent that used to appear on those shows. And I think it was an idea of trying to revive professional wrestling in Australia, which hadn't really gotten some huge exposure. I believe WCW toured Australia in the back end of 2000. And they were very successful shows because Australia was starved of major professional wrestling. So they wanted to try and exploit that market and then spread further afield with tours lined up in, take place in America and in the UK and then back in Australia. So, yeah, it took place in front of 8,500 people. So it was a decent sized crowd for their first show. Yeah, it's not bad. Yeah. And so this was the culmination of the first tour that they took place. So The Inception, their first pay-per-view. So originally, the the booker for World Wrestling All Stars was lined up to be Vince Russo. Of course, because of course, but <laughs> eventually Vince Russo decided to pull out of doing this and instead recommended to McManus that the head booker should be Jeremy Borash. Yes, because they'd worked together a long time in the W. Well, for the last year or so of Russo's reign in WCW, Borash was one of his like right hand men. men. So he would be the head booker and the head of talent for 
WWE during its run. And yeah, he also it's... gets in the ring. Oh yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll we'll talk about that as well. Uh, don't want to spoil it overall, but I think we have to give a precursor to this show, at least in my perspective, that it's one of the five worst wrestling shows that I've ever seen. <laughs> And that's only because I've seen stuff like Heroes of Wrestling that I can put this on there. I've seen Dogs Hate it as well. They have just, yeah, well as soon yeah. as I mention it, they just go crazy. <laughs> but um, it's just, it's unbelievably awful. Yeah, it's, uh, it's something. We have to break this down, but I, as I said to you, I've seen the show live i saw it when it aired in early 2002 in the united states this was something because at first like as a kid you're like wow bret hart's here and and jared and luger and like it it feels big but watching it now especially that fucking ending it's just atrocious yeah this is i mean you would be remiss in thinking that this was a Vince Russo book show with how unbelievably batshit insane it is. It it's it encapsulates a lot of what was terrible about 2000 WCW. Yes. So we open up with a start. So Jerry Borash announces the event and and introduces the Foreman group who I could not tell what name he gave them. It's like Ashaka or something like that. I can't remember. But they do the Australian national anthem. And then after an opening video package, which is just a lot of clips of the um, tour that's taken place so far across Australia, which apparently, believe it or not, was actually a lot better than this show because they didn't go all crazy with the booking on all the other ones because they were just house shows. Yeah, it was probably a decent show because like, the, the talent in WWA is there. Mm. Like These are dudes that are going to lead TNA and still be, you know, forces within the wrestling industry it just seems like it's wrestling in 2001 hit everybody with a chair throw yeah. throw shit at the wall see what sticks you know, it just seems so crazy so they do an opening video and then the music and then there's a shot of pyro and everything just goes dark and quiet for about <laughs> 10 seconds when they just <laughs> i sh- and then and then they eventually do some more sparks and brett hart's music plays and brett hart comes out so brett hart is the commissioner for the WWA, because every show needed a commissioner at this point in time. Yeah, they, they uh, hadn't evolved to the term general manager yet. So this is obviously prior to, only a couple of months prior to Bret Hart suffering a stroke Which in 2002. Yeah. But do you, do you know who would take over for Bret Hart when he suffers that stroke as the commissioner of WWA? Would it happen to be Sid Vicious? It would not. A... It, would, it, it would be Macho Man Randy Savage. Oh no, what's I see, I think you might be getting a few wires crossed there. The idea that uh, Randy Savage was supposed to main event the next big pay per view they did, had against Jeff Jarrett for the title. Oh, so. So, Sid so Vicious, was it Sid that took over? Really? Sid, Sid became the uh, next uh, commissioner of the WWA. Really? Uh, for, and then when he had to leave, um, the next, the final commissioner of the WWA was Mike Sanders. Above average Mike Sanders. <laughs> what a great name. For, yeah. For so, um, so yeah, but wait, Randy Savage. Wait, is was that supposed... the second time that Randy Sa- or the first of two that Randy Savage is supposed to fight Jericho, uh, Jared for a world title and backs out? Yeah, pretty much. I imagine. Amazing. So, so do you know who um, Savage's replacement was in that title match? For some reason, the name Crowbar keeps sticking out. Uh, no, it was uh, Brian Christopher, or Grandmaster Sexa. Oh, yeah, because, God, let me tell you something, Callum. If I had Macho Man or Eddie Savage booked for an event and he pulled out, I would say, Grandmaster Sexa, it is your time. You're well, replacing I, the Macho Man. I guess a lot of the issues at that point in time, because that, that next pay you takes place in 2002, I believe, and by that point, a lot of people who they probably could have signed who were decent names had started signing up with the WWF again. And so they just thought that was the best they could offer. That's hysterical. So we have, so Hart's coming out. We meet our commentators, which are Jeremy Borash and Jerry Lawler 
on his brief, only a month or so away from him leaving WWE to uh, join up with. We're actually going to see uh, Jerry Lawler in the XWF as well. Oh my god! He was just doing the rounds before he would end up rejoining uh, WWF at in the like um, middle of November. <laughs> like, I know. Yeah, middle of November he comes back. He comes back the night after Survivor Series. Unreal, man. So uh, Hart does a nice little promo where he talks about how it's great to be in Australia and it's great to be there after 23 years of like not being there before in his career. Says people are going to have a lot of fun tonight, which is a lie. And uh, <laughs> talk about how... Um, Talks about how he had to stay in Australia because when he was over doing some promotion work when the uh, 9-11 attacks happened and how the people of Australia were very kind to him. The crowd actually pops when he mentions the fact that he couldn't get out of the country. Because of yeah! The stuff. <laughs> what a, like, I mean... all right, I think it's one thing to pop for the fact that he's like, yeah, I had to stay in Australia and your country's great. But it's another thing to seemingly pop for 9-11, which is just an ungodly yeah. thought. So Hart takes an opportunity to try and put himself over by saying that he's the real world champion of everything because no one's ever beaten him for the title. So, I know. I, uh, salty Bret Hart is a guilty pleasure of mine, but like I just wish this dude, this dude is Jim Cornette if Jim Cornette was a wrestler. Like this dude is so salty about everything all yeah, so the time. Yeah, so he talks about the fact that no wrestler currently in the WWF ever beat him one-on-one, and nobody ever beat him for the WWE Championship because he was taken out by Goldberg. Calls Vince McMahon a piece of shit, and the crowd pops for that as well. (laughs) And then he says that the winner, basically, he's passing the torch to whoever wins it by taking his title, which is the WWE world title that he's holding. And says the person who... Unless you use his finisher, at which point he'll fucking... No contest. Yeah. Says it's great to be part of a company with some integrity. (laughs) And Dude, well, so, hold on. Do you think he was trying to come back before he had that stroke? No, I think it's Fuck quite off. well. I think it's quite well founded that almost not not because of Hart having a stroke, but Hart's stroke was part of the reason why they bridges started to form between him and Vince McMahon, because Vince was one of the first people to contact Brett to wish him well and to check on how he was doing. So, and then from that point on, they started having a few conversations about. Uh, launching the DVD, which ended up with Bret Hart coming back and to be part of the Hall of Fame. And then he eventually returned full-time, pretty much, in 2011. That DVD is my favourite because Vince is almost held at gunpoint and literally has to thank Bret Hart for being big enough to do the DVD. Yeah, exactly. But... So we don't we don't see much Bret Hart obviously after this point. I mean we see him on the show, but we don't see much of his association with WWE. I think he appears on one more WWE show because that happens before his stroke. But after he has a stroke, I think he appears one more time in his first public appearance after having a stroke to do a promo. Yeah, I think I, I think, remember that. I think that was the final WWE pay per view. So at least he got that moment, and. So then we talk about when Hart, uh, Hart goes away, we took uh, Borash, which I think there was this odd thing, which was, I believe, pretty much throughout the entire show, that Borash's and Lawler's commentary was being piped through the loudspeakers to the, to the audience so they could hear what the commentators were saying. Because you, yeah. can tell, you can tell that because, especially during one of the matches when Lawler's making a load of jokes, the crowd started laughing. Well... So, that's not the worst idea. Like, I think there should be an option. Like, I think there should be, like, headphones or something at shows to have an option. I mean, I but... would probably... I mean, nowadays, I would pay WWF not to listen not to the to have... <laughs> on certain shows, but, you know. <laughs> uh, but Borash starts to explain that this is the start of the Seven Deadly Sins tournament, which is seven matches in one tournament to crown the first WWA World Champion, and that every match would have a stipulation attached to it. This is not the worst idea. I gotta tell you, like, in theory, it's not a bad idea. In execution, however. It was the worst idea. <laughs> because <laughs> cause it was so, it, this was such a Vince Russo tournament. And anyone who knows Vince Russo tournaments knows that that's a bad thing. So, swerve. swerve. Hey, yeah. look at that, swerve. <laughs> I mean, it's more than that. It's, it's just a load, like, you're supposed to be building up your world champion. 
and another spoiler alert here, only one match on this entire card goes it's longer than 10 minutes. minutes. Yeah. That's, and that's how Vince Russo always did tournaments. Always just a bunch of short, meaningless matches which get nobody over. There's a three-minute dog collar match, though. Well, we'll get onto that, but we'll start off with the um, the first round match, which was also for the WWA International Cruiserweight Championship, a ladder match between Juventud Guerrero and Psychosis. Now, stop. If you say those words to me, again, no context, kind of like the XWF, say ladder, Hoobie, Psychosis, I'm in. Until the match starts. This is, I mean, this is terrible, but, uh, so Hoobie's... Hoobie's theme music is the Macarena, right? <laughs> that, it, it, it's some shitty version of the Macarena. It's not actually... I don't think they'd be able to get the rights to it, but he, it's basically the Macarena he comes out to because, you know, Mexican, racist, it's all that stuff. Still uh, better than the Mexicals, I want to clarify. Still better than the yeah. Mexicals. And then he starts mocking the rocks, talking, because he talks about, finally, the juice is back in Australia. Do you know what happened the last time uh, the juice was in Australia? Please tell me. Uh, so it's the WCW tour in October of 2000. Uh, so during uh, their tour of Australia, uh, Hoovenshood was arrested at the hotel in which the wrestlers were staying after an incident where he was discovered naked and screaming in a hallway. And then once he was, uh, once he was, uh, the police tried to calm him down, he attacked a load of the police officers and got arrested and deported back to uh, America. This uh, guy is like the cruiserweight Ric Flair. What the fuck is his problem? Uh, so according to uh, the uh, d- the death of WCW book, uh, Hoovy was apparently under the influence of PCP, which caused him to behave in this way. And so he was uh, fined by WCW and eventually fired pretty soon after coming back from the tour. So, yeah, that's, uh, that's not having the last and time. Finally, the juice has come back to Australia. Yeah, so so that, so here we have two of the next calls against each other. This was a pretty. It started off pretty slowly until Hoovy does like a nice spinning heel kick and a tilt the world DDT, and then it's just a load of spots of Hoovy dropping the the uh, ladder on Psychosis's head, pretty much, just throwing it into like pushing it into his face or dropping it on his head or something like that. It's really like pretty pedestrian for these two considering what they could do in the ring. Yeah, but they're not going to go boss the wall for Australia. No, I imagine not. So they do this weird thing where um, so Psychosis drape, drapes Hoovy over the top rope and then he climbs all the way up to the ladder to do a leg drop. So oh. I guess it's like slightly cool, but, you know, it's just really, really slow. Then there's this, then our first great botch of the evening. Which is Psychosis climbs the ladder in the corner and is going to dive onto Psychosis. But as he dives, the ladder gives way because it starts falling backwards because he's about to dive forward. And so he doesn't go very far. So uh, Psychosis has to pretty much move towards Hoovy to grab him to prevent him from killing himself as he falls. And so they both just land in a heap. And then referee goes down to check on both of them and the ladder falls over and hits him on the back of the head <laughs> as it comes down. <laughs> Absolutely. Like, first of all, it's hilarious, and second of all, the referee doesn't sell the ladder hitting him on the back of the head. He just, he just, he just, uh, like rubs his head a little bit and then goes back to officiating the match, making it seem like every time it landed on <laughs> on Psycho's head before that, it didn't actually hurt him at all. He was just faking because it's fake wrestling. Oh, but the, 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 these they're not tough like Australian referees. You see, Cal, Australians yeah. are tough. Mm. Uh, so then Hoovy does a sunset flip power bomb onto Psychosis, hits a 450 splash, and then climbs to the top and grabs the uh, grabs the title to win the Cruiserweight Championship. Uh, he would he would hold on to the Cruiserweight Championship to um, the next show. Who do you think defeats him for the title? Ha! I'm gonna say his other Mexico partner, Super Crazy. No, it's actually Eddie Guerrero. Uh, after his release, why wouldn't it be? After his release from the uh, WWF in 2001, obviously he goes around on the independent circuit for a while and he wins it on the next pay-per-view. Uh, but then he is forced to just relinquish it because he re-signs with the WWF a couple of months afterwards. So, yeah, pretty yeah, much. I think it's funny that Eddie was still labelled a cruiserweight, like mm-hmm. two years away from being world champion. 
So, yeah, well, he wasn't big enough yet because he had to be big, obviously. To, yeah. To yeah. 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 Uh, yeah, but this wasn't a very good opener. And it was only going to get worse from here. My favorite, so, I'll spoil his favorite. Now, my favorite thing on this show is the Battle Royal. And only because of Jeremy Forash. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll, we'll get onto that point. So they, um, they bring out the Starrettes, which is basically an Australian version of the um, WW Nitro Girls. Lawler asks during their routine if these puppies like to play with each other. Oh, I don't... Ask yourself. We've talked about lingerie matches where the, really the only thing is, hey, look, they're in lingerie. Why, mm. why, why wasn't women's wrestling respected? A- ask yourself. Like, try oh, to come up with we got a long, we got a long way to go. No, we got a long way to go for this one. <laughs> Uh, so a limo pulls up with uh, Nathan Jones and Rove McManus, who was an Australian comedian. Uh, so they basically come out to get ready for their match, and they run into Lenny and Lodi doing their homosexual gimmick, where they basically are, you know, I, I mean, Billy and Chuck, you can say anything about that, but they didn't take it this far or be this offensive. Yeah, and if only you knew that the real hook with that angle was supposed to be they found out that they were stepbrothers. So, uh, Disco Inferno is backstage as well, saying that he talks to someone backstage telling him that he wants two suits to defend him because he needs security. And then we move on to the dog collar match between Conan and the Road Dog. Ro- Road Dog has some sort of bootleg version of his WWF music and he tries to do his introduction, but Conan hits him and does his own parody of Road Dog's WWF introduction. Conan immediately hits him with the Mexican title belt, and they get started. Essentially, the dog collar match is that they're both wearing collars with a chain attached between them, and it's like a bull rope match where you have to hit all four corners. Or, as Jerry says on commentary, you can also win by pinfall. <laughs> because, because why not? Because why not? I think I think that is the gist of World Wrestling All-Stars. Yeah, why not? Yeah, you want to do this? Yeah, why not? So basically have this uh, during one point in the match where I think Conan's doing the 10 punches into the corner on Road Dog, a logo for the hardcore match that's about to come up uh, just flashes up on screen because this is the lowest production quality you can ever possibly imagine. Or or, because why not? Exactly. Why not? Why not Why not just tease the next match that's about to happen? Um, so Conan like does his spot where he's mocking RVD's Oh, not RVD. I've got I've got it written down RD, which is why I'm saying yeah. RVD in my notes. Road dog punches, you know the little like sh- shimmy that he does before doing the uh, flip flop and fly. Yep. But but his punches are even worse than road dogs because they don't even look like they're connecting at all. Coming out at one point, takes off his chain to attack road dog. His chain comes off multiple times during this match because it's so low rent. And yeah. So, but uh, th- this time at least there's a reason for it so he takes it off so he sends the referee chasing after the chain and he uses it to attack Road Dog with a crowbar despite the fact that he's already attacked him with a title belt and low blowed Road Dog and it hasn't been a DQ he still feels and the need to have to de- be because it's a chain match but who yeah. and he still but feels why not the- yeah, he still feels the need to have to distract the referee so he can use a crowbar uh, he tries it again but Road Dog just uh he sent to dive on Road Dog with the crowbar, but Road Dog gets his foot up to block it, and then Road Dog hits him with his own weapon, and then ties up Conan's legs with the chain, and then mimes fucking him from behind, which is not the first time we're going to see someone, like, fake fucking someone from behind on this show. Uh, and then he hits all four corners, and his dog collar falls off at the time that he hits the fourth turnbuckle. This is one of the this is an absolutely minus four star match. I, Atrocious. So some interesting things that keep flashing in my head as you're saying these names are they're gonna be a team pretty soon in TNA as three live crew. And I keep thinking of Conan, who was a big star at one point in Mexico, who doesn't get a job at WWF at the time. Because he called, and this is according to Bruce Pritchard, so grant of salt, but he called WF Talent Relations and said, yo, it's K-Dog. And nobody knew who that was, so nobody bothered to call him back. 
Uh, it, do- it doesn't surprise me if that was true. I always, I always take what Pritchard says with a grain of salt, but at that point, I'm just thinking, yeah, that sounds about right. Oh, uh, God. Well, let's move on to a hardcore match, which wasn't even part of the tournament. It's just a hardcore match for the sake of a hardcore match. This is probably, if you're just going straight up wrestling, the best match on the show. Because at least Devon Storm mm. is who's crowbar in WCW. I think it's just amazing that the previous match had two people attacking each other with crowbars, and then you have the crowbar wrestler come out for the next match. And he doesn't even use a crowbar. No. Uh, what do you know? But he actually looks like he's in decent shape, and he's actually has a few quite innovative spots. I remember him, because of these shows, becoming a brief favourite of mine. And he would never really go on to do anything major afterwards. And Norman Smiley's fun, even though the screaming stuff and the wig are always a little bit childish. But at least it's, like with certain other stuff on the show, it's at least not so abhorrent as compared to a lot of other stuff. Um, so this is where we see our second uh, spot of somebody just like miming doing the doggy style from behind with uh, Norman Smiley doing the big w- wiggle. There's a slingshot plancher that Crowbar does through Smiley and a table on the outside. And Smiley starts screaming. But then he's almost, like, within 30 seconds, he's back on his feet and he's hitting uh, Crowbar with a uh, steel chair uh, with a trash can over Crowbar's head. And then they go backstage and they get pushed into Disco Inferno, who's on a cell phone backstage. Disco Inferno, if you wouldn't get told anything, you'd think that was the, he was the biggest star on the entire show with the amount of appearances that he made. But again, this is a Jeremy Borash slash yeah. Vince Russo production. Glenn so, Gilberti. There, there you go. Then Smiley's placed on top of two tables, and uh, Storm like somehow manages to superbly throw a trash can right on top of the staging without it falling off at all. <laughs> that was amazing. And then he just throws the trash can onto Smiley like it, like he didn't even expect it to be there when he was doing it. And then he just does a splash through both tables and Smiley. But the swerve. It actually meet, results in Smiley pinning Storm to win the match. Even though he was the one that took the attack. Because he's this like prime Norman Smiley, fresh air WCW comedic act. Yeah, that's it, like a shitty finish, but overall I'd say it was a reasonably fun hardcore match. We go backstage and Disco Inferno runs into the dude who he asked to go get in suits, and he ends up bringing two fruits in suits. Uh... Are you aware of the pajo- bananas in pyjamas? I love the bananas in pyjamas. I used so... to... Actually, I got... One, I got them for Christmas one time, when I was very young. So, yeah, so they're just like a, a mocked version of them for the Australian audience, because I think it was like an originally an Australian TV show. Yeah. So... They announced that uh, Hoobie's injured and won't be able to compete in the match against Road Dogg in the home finals. So Stevie Ray is instead backstage with Bret Hart. And we can't hear what Ray asks Bret Hart because the crowd noise is too loud. So he just, the production value is just terrible in this show. And uh, so Hart says that anyone, anyone at all involved in the World Wrestling All-Stars can get involved in the Battle Royal. Whether it's program sellers or bus drivers or ring crew or Penthouse Honeys, which is so weird to hear Bret Hart say that. And Stevie says, well, what about announcers? He says, what about them? Yeah, you can get in there. You better hurry up and get there. And Stevie Ray says that he's in and does his little mug for the camera. And then, yep. we, get into, and then we get into well, your highlight of the night, which is the Battle Royal. Oh, yeah. Uh, I mean, it, it's, <laughs> it's mental. It's crazy. It's a crazy it, match. It's so good. Just because, and I think it's Stevie Ray, Lawler decides, I'm getting in the ring because I work here. And Jeremy, come on, you're coming too. And he's like, no, King, I'm not a wrestler. But puts Borash in the ring. Lawler holds who I believe is Stevie Ray. And Jeremy Borash just throws the best rapid fire three stooges punches I've ever seen in my life. And it's just, it's just ass. Like, it's just the dumbest stuff. But you know what, Callum? Why not? 
yeah, absolutely. Look, it's definitely not the most offensive or bad thing on this show. So I'll give it that. So basically, the match starts with Buff Bagwell as the first entrant, and the Disco Inferno comes out second, and they just start fighting without any other people even entered yet. Then Stevie Ray joins, then Norman Snipe, Miley and Devin Storm from their previous match join this one. Then Lawler and Borash, as you mentioned, enter. Borash is the first man eliminated, being dumped over by Stevie Ray. Then the cameraman drops his camera and he jumps into the ring. And then two two of the referees on the outside get in the ring and they get involved in the match as well. And then this, this um then after he's eliminated, uh, Devon Storm goes on commentary. And was, why was he every time he said something, he always went he always went eh, eh, at the end of every sentence that he said. Mm-hmm. Was was that I like personally just based on what he was doing, I thought he was mocking Jim Ross's cerebral palsy by doing that. No, I think it was um the fucking villain from You ever see Wacky Races? Uh yeah. Like the guy with the mustache and he used what, to Dick go, Dastardly. Yeah, he, he used to go, yeah, uh, uh, that's what that's that sounds like to me. But it was just every sentence was so obnoxious. Like it's not like the commentary was great on this show, but that was just another level of terribleness. Then a random ring girl in a gold dress enters the ring and starts like attacking Lawler. And then Lawler drops her down, and then he goes all, like, you know, sexy, crazy uncle on top of her. <laughs> and then she just decides to leave the ring of her own accord to make sure that she doesn't end up on a, um, <laughs> end up in a trial situation, I guess, really. Uh, you think then... Jerry would be more inclined to avoid trials? Yeah, no. Uh, we start with, uh, everyone agrees to team up on Stevie Ray, but then when they all go to charge, like they do a countdown like three, two, one, and they all, and then only Disco Inferno charges at them while the other baby faces just stand there and watch it. And then so they all like Ray eventually gets eliminated and then both Smiley and uh Lawler are eliminated at the same time. And then the suit fruit suits and fruits come down. And so Disco Inferno's in the ring with Bagwell, and he gets the upper hand, because they start having, I guess, what can be closely approximated into a wrestling match. And then when Disco's out there celebrating, uh, both suits get in the ring, and they throw him out of the ring. And then they're celebrating, and Bagwell throws both of them out of the ring, which the camera doesn't see, because it's too busy staring at Disco Inferno on the outside. So Bagwell wins in this really, really dumb battle <laughs> But, you know, I, I think we should invest in a Fruits and Suits appearance for WrestleMania. Well, I don't know how much they cost, but you definitely got plenty of them in this show. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Not the last time we'll see either Fruits on this uh, card. But we see a backstage interview where Nathan Jones and Rove McManus are being interviewed. Uh, Rose says the only thing that Jeff will be stroking tonight is himself back in the hotel room. Wow! <laughs> Rove was funny. I like Rove. Rove is good. Uh, then we have the match itself, which is Nathan Jones, the hometown like Australian hero, who we obviously most people will know as the guy who was seen as too green to have a tag team match with the Undertaker at WrestleMania 19. <laughs> and now he's having a singles match with Jeff Jarrett, but not any just any singles match, a guitar on a pole match. Of course it is. Well, what else would it be, Cal? I don't know there has to be at least one pole match on this show, and it has to be the guitar because you know Jarrett's got that stroke. Yeah, so Jarrett Jarrett does his promo, which is basically every promo he did in WCW in 2000 and 2001, where he talks about how he's the chosen one, where he calls everyone slap nuts, where he says that he has all the stroke in the World Wrestling uh, All-Stars, and then uh, Bret Hart is the commissioner, and that won't hold him back, and then blah de blah de blah Jeff Jarrett is one of the worst main event people of all time. He, like, I always come back to, I don't know whose line it was, but uh, the, the line where someone says that he broke uh, it was, 20, uh Mike Graham. Yeah, broke twenty thousand guitars and never drew a dime. <laughs> <laughs> he re- uh, the the exact quote, which is from the Rise and Fall of WCW DVD, mm-hmm. is he thought in his little pea Tennessee brain mind that he was bigger than Ric Flair or Hulk Hogan. He broke twenty thousand guitars and never drew a dime. And I. I love Jeff Jarrett. As a wrestler, I think Jeff Jarrett's actually pretty good. I, I don't, think he yeah. overdid that stroke stuff. Yeah, I think I think when he got into the main event scene, 
it was a lot. Like there was, there's a lot of qualities to like about Jeff Jarrett. He is a very good wrestler. He does have a lot of charisma, but that WWE stuff was just so over the top, and he just wasn't a main eventer. Like I hate to say it, but he just was never a main event guy, and he never should have been a main event guy. I mean, like he's had his matches. You know, I thought he had a good match with Angle at Bound for Glory in '08. He's obviously had the good one with Sean in the '90s, but. A lot of what people think Triple H does, Jeff Jarrett actually did and didn't do it well. Mm-hmm. So, he's his match against Nathan the Front Row Jones. The what? What? What, what, <laughs> what? What does the Front Row mean? <laughs> I would hope that they would at least have enough wrestling campiness to say it means he's going to kick you so hard that you're going to fly into the front row. Yeah, no, but just. What does it mean? I mean, like, that, like yeah, that must be the only thing for it. Other than that, either that or most of his matches, he sits in the front row and comes out, and that's <laughs> so. Well, so Rove I'm cuts a curious like, now. Yeah, do you think I can Google that and come up with what they meant? Oh, uh, I, I don't want to. Even bo- no, I didn't. I didn't bother. I just like wanted to just leave it in the ether. Really, if you can find it, then go right ahead. But Rove cuts a promo. He talks about how he's proud to be here as a wrestling fan. And he calls Jeff Jarrett a pufter, which is, if you're not familiar with the terminology, it's a gay person because, oh, you know, you know it's still 2001. And then Joan, Jones is going to slap his nuts all up across the ring. <laughs> no, 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 no. Uh, you know what? We have to, to talk about this. Oh, you're, you're gay. That's a bad thing. And I'm going to slap your nuts all across the ring. Yeah, I know. What? <laughs> I know. It just, I try and I try and just drown it out, really. So what happens is that um, so Jones Jones's first move in the match is a spinning slam, which he almost drops Jarrett on the back of his neck. <laughs> it's botched terribly. He does some he does some terrible selling. Like Jeff Jarrett, he like this guy's three hundred pounds, pretty much legitimate, and he's selling for Jeff Jarrett constantly during this match. He does a Corella press lift at one point, which is fairly impressive, where he just lifts Jarrett from the outside in, back into the ring. And then Jarrett crotches Jones as he goes for the guitar, and Rove asks the question, why can't referees, why don't wrestling referees ever see anything? Because uh, this man just wanted to take the piss out of all of this, didn't he? I actually think he is a legitimate wrestling fan. I think he was just... He was just making a joke for like insider wrestling fans that old oh, wrestling referees don't see anything. I don't think he was taking the piss out of it. I thought he was just like having a bit of fun. I mean, it's very possible, but still. Like, well, uh, well, Rove gets into the ring um, to try and interfere on his client's behalf, and he just turns around and Jeff immediately hits him with the uh, guitar, and then immediately after that, he hits the stroke on Nathan Jones and wins the match. So, I just want to put this into context right here. So, the heel who insulted the crowd wins the match clean after the other guy's manager tried to interfere and attack him. He beat him up and then beat the guy with his move clean in the middle of the ring. You know, hometown, home country guy. And Jeff Jarrett just wins. Yeah. He's and, in the front row. And this is not and this is not the most egregious version of what we're gonna see. We'll definitely see more of that in the semi final and the final. Which uh but then we have like another conservative Star X performance. And then Lawler comes back from backstage because he went backstage to chase after the fruits and suits to try and get an interview with them. And so oh. Lawler Yeah, I know. Cause, he, <laughs> Cause he's a wrestling journalist. <laughs> Yeah, well, God bless him for chasing after the fruits and suits. So he uh, comes, he comes out, and he gets the fruits and suits out there to ask them why they turned on Disco, despite the fact that we clearly saw on the screen that Disco Inferno pushed them both into a wall because he didn't want them to be his security for the night. And then they're interrupted by Lenny and Lodi, who come out, and Lodi's carrying a load of signs which say stuff like Nicole Kidman is a bush pig. Being in Australia blows. We hate Australia. You know, heel stuff. 
Nicole Kidman is a Bush pig. I know. Wow. And then bought... Like, this was a time when Nicole Kidman was, like, huge. Yeah, I think... Well, wasn't she still with... Like, she was big in America, still with Tom Cruise. Big deal. Yeah. So, a sign in the crowd says, um, Lenny and Lodi blow me away. Because... Yeah, it does. Yeah. And Borash calls them a very flamboyant tag team. Lawla says, um, Lawla says the iconic line, wow, now we have four fruits in the ring. Because, you know, they're gay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I just, I gotta say, if you ever wonder why some people get legitimately pissed off when now we see people within WWE being like, well, they're out of the closet, and isn't that great, and it's so great. People get mad about that because wrestling is so rooted in this. Like, I know. So bad. I mean, especially in... I don't, I don't want to, like, stereotype anything, but especially in Australia at the time, there was a lot of this sort of rhetoric. So, and Lenny says a line where he says that behind Chopper Reed, who was a convicted gang mem- member in Australia... They were the toughest men in Australia, him and Lodi. And to which Lawler replies that he bets they wish they were behind Chopper Reed. Because, you know, bumming. Because <laughs> yep. it's, it's too... This is the 21st century. This is still in the 21st century that this stuff is happening. And then Hart come, Brett Hart comes out and says that the semi-final, because Hoon too injured, is now going to be a three-way dance between Road Dog, Lodi and Lonnie. Because he doesn't know who Lenny's name is. <laughs> <laughs> well, Hart, well, Lonnie, Lonnie will do just fine. He was never great on promos, Bret Hart. So, um, and then they have this freeway dance immediately, and this is without question or shadow of a doubt the most offensive match to watch in 2019 eyes <laughs> I could possibly imagine. <laughs> yeah, are you? <sighs> yeah. This is. This is what this match is one like five minute gay joke. <laughs> As was a lot of wrestling TV in two thousand one. I know. I mean, like people always get on the back of WWF for, and, and rightly so for the Billy and Chuck stuff, and like some other stuff they've done in the past as well with, uh, like Gold Dust and people ladies like that. Ladies and gentlemen, give it up for the lesbians. We're only a, yeah. um, a year out from that closing Raw. Yeah. And but this is just takes it to a whole number another level. So we have like a spot where like Road Dog clotheslines both of them and it ends up with uh Lodi behind Lenny in the um like doggy position. And then Lawler asks if they get their wrestling tights from Victoria's Secret. Mm. They 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 do some spots where they like they they get the better of the road dog, but they keep trying to knock each other off each other's pins because both of them want to win the match because it's a three way, it's not a handicap match. It's, so, a three, it's a three way, you say? Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, in more ways than one. In certain ways, um, Lawler, I'm oh, not Lawler. Lenny at one point uh, crawls over the road dog in a style which essentially nowadays le- the, the Velveteen Dream could do that and would get the loudest pop in the entire night. Lenny does it and it's meant to get heel heat. And it's, yeah, yo, this is the worst. This is disgusting. Yeah, and and this time it's so stupid because Lodi doesn't interrupt the count and Road Dog doesn't kick out at three, but the referee just has to stop counting because Road Dog's <laughs> supposed to win the match. So it's like, it's even worse. Like, they're botching as well as anything else. And then they do the spot where um, Lodi starts doing, like, ramming uh, Road Dog's head into the corner repeatedly while Lodi is straddling it. Because, you know, it makes it look like Road Dog's giving him a blowjob. <laughs> Lawler calls Lodi at one point a pickle kisser. Like, just straight up says, I'll oh, take that, you pickle kisser. <laughs> so, it's so offensive. It's so terrible. Can you fucking imagine saying anything like that right now? Mm. Oh my god, that is awful. So, Take that, you pickle kisser. Yeah. I think the crowd like pops for that as well, because obviously they could hear it over the um, house mics. And then 
uh, Lenny and Lodi start fighting while Borash is wondering how much of them they share besides being tag team partners. And then Lenny moonsaults Lodi and they end up in a 69 position. And Road Dog beats them, and I'm not making this up, with a running knee drop. Damn right he does. Did he shake before it, though? That is... The shimmy before it makes it, yeah. Yeah, like that, that's like powering up a command. Anyway, it just is what it is. And he pins both of them while they're in the 69 position. Of course he does. Wait, this... wait, no. Because mm. wouldn't the one on top of the other be the one who wins the match? I mean, yeah, but at this point, does logic really matter for anything? <laughs> but, but, but why not? I, I mean, the most important thing was they were doing the 69 during it because, you know, this Yay. is... This okay. is the this is the most offensive match of all time. Like, well, at least one of them. It has to it has to be up there with like some of the most offensive matches of all time. Did Terrible. you know they were gay? The funny thing is, they in real life they weren't. So it's like it's like, oh huh. god, this is terrible. Yeah. And they carried on that gimmick into the like the first few years of TNA as well. Alongside Mortimer Plumtree, who I think. <laughs> They they added to it in TNA, and I'll leave it at that in case we ever do a 2002 Wrestling Odyssey. Oh, don't give me... Uh, I'll tell you this. If we're doing 2002, I'm just pretending TNA doesn't exist for a while. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't, want, I don't want to dive into that like uh, can of worms right there. Then we have uh, Stevie Ray interviews Buff Bagwell, where we hear Stevie Ray's most iconic line, Suckers got to know. <laughs> they, they, I mean, they do, though. I know, they got to know. Uh, so he makes uh, Buff Bagwell hold the mic for him while he puts his glasses and beret back on. And then Buff says that he has a special stipulation for the semi final, which he just refers to as tits, whips, and buff. Say that again, please. Tits, whips, and buff. Is, is that. No, never mind. <laughs> well,. I mean, that probably links a lot to his career post-wrestling as well, but we'll yeah. save that for another day. Yeah. But essentially what this match is between Jeff Jarrett and Buff Bagwell is Buff is flanked by a lot of the starettes who are wearing skimpy outfits and are carrying whips. And it's a lumberjack match where if somebody goes out of the ring, they get whipped by the girls. Except, uh, so what happens when Jarrett goes out, he gets out and gets whipped by a lot of the girls. But when Buff gets in the goes outside, he gets like a massage from the girls because he the girls all like him. Like he's the big ladies man. Well, but he's he's Buff Daddy. Mm. Yeah. And then there's this spot where Jeff Jarrett has Buff Bugger in a camel clutch for about fifty minutes, it feels like. <laughs> Got the, I mean every other match was like insanely stupid and this match is just absolutely boring. Like and then Bagwell starts whipping Jarrett on the floor, and when the ref stops him from whipping it, uh, the re- he gets the girls to start whipping the referee. So the referee is just like being whipped up the ramp, and Bagwell hits the blockbuster and has a pin on Jarrett, and one of the girls counts the pinfall. So Jarrett feel so Bagwell thinks like he's won, even, oh, though yeah. that, even though it doesn't count because it's one of the girls doing it. And so immediately after the referee waves it off. Jarrett hits the stroke and wins the match. Because of course he does. Ah. Uh, so. Th- this is. Th- this is bad. Like, this is just not good, guys. I want you to know, like, this is the biggest failure, maybe the biggest failure in wrestling, as a attempted promotion. So, after the match where Jarrett beats the hometown guy with his move. He then there's an, I, I wanted to try and break this down as simply as I could so people could totally understand it. So the heel, Jeff Jarrett, has to win a match where he's got the numbers disadvantage and everyone surrounding the ring wants to beat him up and wants to help the other guy, the babyface, to win. Whereas the babyface cheats by using the whip on his own, gets the stipulation totally in his favour, and then causes his own defeat by forcing the girls, well, by asking the girls to whip the referee when he has the win, so the referee's distracted mm-hmm. when he gets the victory, and Jarrett then just hits his own move, overcomes all the odds, and wins the match. But, but, why not? Uh, 
why are we doing this is part of the question that I'm yeah. asking. <laughs> well, I, I think this is a punishment in your own mind. I don't know if you feel like you need to atone for something, Callum, but here we are. A lot of people have to atone for this show. I probably have to say. <laughs> but we move on to the black wedding match between Luna Vachon and Vampire Warrior. So this was Luna Vachon and uh, Gangrel who are married, who were in married real in real life. Yeah. yeah. And so apparently Luna didn't. Luna didn't interview, which said she came to Australia to renew her wedding vows. But after Vampire Warrior had been constantly bitching and moaning and losing on the tour, she'd had enough and wanted to just kick his ass. So they have this match. It's basically just a street fight with some wedding cake and stuff like that around the ring. Uh, Vampire Warrior doesn't want to fight Luna because it's his wife, but and so she just keeps fighting him. At one point, he lifts her up and slams her into the wedding cake. And you can hear someone in the crowd audibly shout, Oh, look, the wedding cake. Oh, jeez. That <laughs> just like, just I love wrestling fans sometimes, especially when they just get picked up. It's like the Winnipeg, you idiot, that type of thing. Yeah. You, th- you think... I feel like this match would do better in 2019 eyes. It's like the woman asserting dominance. The, the man just like, No, nah, I don't, I don't want to fight you. I'm sorry I'm a loser, but... I'm not fighting you, and she just beats the shit out of him. Lawler, obviously back in 2001, asked in the country, what would happen if Vampire Warrior is beaten by his wife? A female. He legitimately <laughs> says, a female. God, like... <laughs> well, I'm glad we established, first of all, that Gangrel might suck your blood, but he's no pickle kisser. That's the first order of business that, Gary, that Jerry Lawler needed to establish. And then uh... the thing, a man... Being beaten by a, a woman? No. Just can't happen. So at one point, uh, Luna grabs a vampire warrior with a set of kitchen tongs. Oh, like of course. Never raging. And then uh, Luna removes the wedding ring and spits in the face of vampire warrior, and then vampire warrior immediately hits the Impaler DDT and wins the match. Good. She yeah. deserves it. <laughs> like, that's me. Like, uh, listen, if you play that movie... They're clearly Gangrel as the baby face. So then Stevie Ray backstage is now interviewing a very muscular, quote unquote, woman whose back is facing the camera. And then he says, what's your name? Suckers got to know. And then they, the, the woman just walks away. And then he just stares at the camera and says, but Suckers got to know. That's just like, <laughs> this is, I think Stevie Ray should come back on WWE Backstage mm. with a segment called Suckers Got to Know. And then we have our Fatal 4 way skin to win match between Adara James, Shannon A. Ward, Queen B, and Violet, Violet Tarossa. Tarossi, Sh- should I say. Shannon A. Ward is my favorite name for a wrestler. Uh, so. I will say one positive about this, which is it seemed, at least by the match, that Adara James knew how to somewhat wrestle. Because, But this, this is the weirdest thing, because I'm not going to defend this in the sense that this is a skin-to-win match, and it's disgusting, it, shouldn't take pl- it definitely wouldn't take place in 2019, it shouldn't even be taking place in 2001. But if you're going to promise a match where it's a load of women stripping each other, then have the women strip each other. Yeah. Don't do the... Like, because it's just, this is so Russo, where he promises skin and then he just doesn't deliver because, essentially, he's a man who I assume didn't get a lot as a guy growing up. And I say this as a man who who doesn't get a lot in his life growing up. But, and at least I'm not as fucked in the head as he is, but it's just a case of, like, just wants to tease the people rather than, you know, give them what they paid for. So... We get to the point where the guy who Sharon A. Ward is just actually a wrestler called uh, Danny Dominion, who's just like a prelim guy in WWA. And he strips both B and Violet's tops off, but they're wearing stuff underneath it, so it's not really stripping them. And the crowd boo because, you know, they're expecting to see skin because this is a skin to win match and they don't get anything because, of course, they don't. It's on pay per view. Yep. Uh, and then we see Adara, and, th- and then Adara and Dominion just have a match, a wrestling match. And it's not, a, a, listen, she she's a better wrestler than a lot of women probably were at this point in time. But it's not a great match by any stretch of the imagination. Like we see a sit-out powerbomb by Dominion. It's just a straight-up intergender wrestling match. 
Can you imagine if Danny, Danny Dominion was to lose to a female? Well, yeah, but that's the that's again the even worse part because it's getting more and more awkward as the match goes on because the crowd is so dead for this because they wanted to just see basically a load of naked women and they're just getting an actual wrestling match which they didn't want to see. So Stevie Ray comes down to the ring and he attacks Dominion for no for no reason other than he just didn't answer his question earlier in the interview. Well, that's you see, suckers got to know, mm. and when you don't tell suckers what they got to know, then you got to get got. Like it's just, it's just what it is. And so Adara hits a Hurricane Rana from the top rope and then removes Danny Dominion's dress. So the only one we actually saw any skin for is the dude. And then she ties him up with his dress and rides him around the ring. And the crowd is just like completely dead at this point because they've been completely screwed on a stipulation. Yeah, I mean... Ugh, how the hell this promotion lasted more than this show, I don't know. So Borash comes at, uh, as Borash is on the commentary and announces that WWE is soon going to be touring the UK in December 2001. And that uh, Andrew McManus, the promoter, comes out and hands Borash a letter from Medasia saying that she'll be at those shows with her man. You know what that means? Yep. I can hear the sirens in my head already. So Scott Steiner did actually appear for the uh, WWA on those shows in 2001, uh, despite the fact that he was still stu- suffering from a club foot. Well, Steiner would be their champion as well. Yeah, at one point before... He was signed up for the uh, WWE in late 2002. You know who he, he would be for that championship? I believe it was Nathan Jones. Front row Nathan Jones. Yeah, because, you know, they can't have the hometown guy ever hold. Well, to be fair, they gave the title to Nathan Jones because uh, Jeff Jarrett was too busy. He basically the vacated TNA. the WWE title because he became TNA world champion. so Or NWA world champion, as it was at the time. So... We basically say, they basically talk about how great it was to be in Australia and how great the fans have been. And then they set up a steel cage for the final match of the tournament. <coughs> so, excuse me. Look, 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 hold on. This show has gotten Callum sick, guys. This yeah. WWE nonsense has gotten Callum sick. I've been talking a lot. It's been three hours. Give me a break. Yes. It's like, so the Starrets come out and dance again, but Disco Inferno stops them, so they don't even get the girls dancing. Because, you know, why give them anything that they want at this point? Like, how lovely the Australian crowds have been, but you still don't give them anything. And they, he, this guy Inferno comes out, stands in the steel cage, and says he wants to deal with the fruits because of what they did. And then so, it basically leads to this bizarre two-on-one handicap match in the steel, steel cage. And it ends with Disco and one of the fruits climbing on top of the cage, where Disco throws him 15 to 20 feet onto a table... That doesn't break on collision. <laughs> what uh, the fuck? Can you put, what the fuck? Can you explain uh, this to me, Rob, please? You see, here's the thing. Here, like, they, they must really think in their minds, Borash and Russo, that Disco Inferno is a star. Because yeah. why this match wasn't just the fruits beating the crap out of Disco Inferno in a cage, I don't know. So Disco celebrates and walks away, and we wait with the camera to see one of the, fr- the fruit that got thrown through the table just stand up and just wave his hand at the people and walk away completely unharmed. Because why sell anything at this point? The night's almost over anyway. And then yep. we have Jeff, Jeff Jarrett gets Road Dog, the longest match on the show. Ten minutes. Ten twenty-six to be precise. We get a lot of Jarrett is a wanker chance from the crowd. Not as effective as Walter is a wanker, but I think it's because Walter and wanker sound close. Yeah. Uh, Bret Hart's on commentary to crown the champion. We see just a load of punch. It's basically a load of punches and throwing them into the steel cage. There's no real wrestling in this match. And then we see Jarrett. Basically, they both climb out of the ring, but it's that doesn't end the match. So essentially, the steel cage doesn't even need to be there. Because they can leave the ring whenever they want to and fight on the outside. Where Road Dog, you know, busts Jeff Jarrett open with the ring bell. So the heel is the one that gets colour first, because of course he does. The sympathetic heel. Yep. <laughs> and then Road Dog collides with the referee by accident. 
and Jeff Jarrett goes in the outside, grabs the guitar and hits the road dog. And then he shouts at Brett, watch this, and puts Road Dog in the sharpshooter. And as the timekeeper's about to ring the bell, Brett Hot says, no, he can't win the match this way. <laughs> so as a kid, I thought that was super cool because I thought Brett was like, yeah, he's standing up for Montreal. But like, as an adult, I'm like, you salty old fuck, what the hell? Yeah, you, I know. You, you didn't invent the move, stop I- it. I mean, it's just so typical that they decide to end this match on a quote-unquote Montreal screw job. But they didn't end the match. Well, no. Well that, well, that that didn't end the match. We get even more. It goes even further than the Montreal screw job in terms of convoluted nature. So what happens is then Road Dog goes to the... Pu- another referee gets into the match, and Road Dog goes to the pump handle slam where he's bumming Jeff Jarrett from behind. And then Jeff Jarrett gets pushed into the other referee, so there's a second ref bump. And then Road Dog low blows Jarrett and then applies his own sharpshooter. And then Bret Hart prevents him from winning it with the sharpshooter because, you know, it's his move and nobody can win it with his move. And so Bret Hart says that, okay, you guys are just going to mess around. I'm just going to take the title and I'm going to go back to the age and neither of you are going to be crowned champion tonight. Road Dog chases him up the ramp, grabs the title, attempts to hit Jarrett with it. Jarrett Jarrett ducks, hits the stroke onto the championship and wins the title. Yep. So once again, the heel overcomes the babyface's cheating and antics to win the match and win the title. And then post-match, uh, Jeff Jarrett finds like he's going to hit Bret Hart with the... Like, he wants a handshake from Bret Hart, but Bret Hart refuses. He finds like he's going to hit Bret Hart in the face with the title belt, but Bret turns around and stares him down. Jeff Jarrett goes like on his knees and begs him off, and Bret Hart puts him in the sharpshooter. And that's so, how you out there. And yeah, so your new world champion is being beaten up by the commissioner who cannot medic is not medically cleared to wrestle ever again. <laughs> like, really, like, I, I said it at the start of it, and I've got to just reinforce it here. This is one of probably in my top three worst wrestling shows that I've ever seen. It wasn't great. <laughs> it wasn't worse than that WOW show we watched earlier this year, though. I don't know. I think I'd rather go back and watch the Whale show than this. I stuff. could never. It's not. I've seen Heroes of Wrestling. It's not as bad as Heroes of Wrestling. But Heroes of Wrestling is like it, it's worse because it's sadder. Because it's like an old, like just a bunch of old men just trying to wrestle. Whereas this is it's got a bunch of guys that's supposed to be in their prime, like guys who were big stars in WCW and ECW. And this show is just so completely nonsensical. Yeah, it really is. Especially in hindsight, that a lot of the uh, homophobic stuff really just irks me because we're in 2019. Yeah. Like, th- okay, listen, he, th- there is a difference because there are people in life that are just wildly sexual. So as, as creepy as that can be, like, that's a thing that people still do. Being so just out and out homophobic for a lot of this show mm. is just fucking wrong. This but show it, it, it's the fake over macho ness of wrestling in just the worst way possible. This match has bad wrestling. It's awfully booked. Most of it makes no sense. It's got poor production quality. It's the commentary's not good. It's homophobic. It's offensive to women. It's it, <laughs> it, 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 it's two thousand one. It, 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 yeah, it hits every single bad category imaginable. I can't besides like like some sort of laughter value you can get out of some of the botches and stuff like that. It holds absolutely zero value as a wrestling show. I think. See, I wouldn't go that far because I would say like you need to sometimes immerse yourself in this to really appreciate where you are today. Oh yeah, I, I mean, I feel a lot better about her and herself after watching uh, <laughs> watching this oh, yeah. piece of shit. But, you know. Because even, but even that is, the Hell in a Cell finish is wrapped up in the context of, it's 2019, we're smarter, we care more about the athletes, whereas you know, this was like do the craziest shit you can, because d- disco, throw the banana off the cage through mm. a table. 
But yeah, that's uh, so that's World Wrestling All Stars Inception. It's minor production note. I think next time we have to review a WWE show and a WWF show, we should do the crap first because at least No Mercy was a good show. I kind of wanted to end on the WWE show first of all because of the chronological side of things, and also I thought there was we'd get that. Hopefully, the people listening would get more entertainment value of us just burying a show as opposed to saying, "Oh yeah, that was pretty good." Oh well, that, that is true, but uh, I don't know. That, this genuinely, like, really just is the worst kind of yeah. wrestling. Well, I, I hope, uh, fortunately, you don't have to worry too much because uh, there is not another WWE show in the remainder of 2001. So we, we won't be seeing another one of their papers. Dodge that bullet, didn't we? For those that are interested in, like, what happens to WWE beyond this, uh, World Wrestling All-Stars just lasts until uh, 2003. Uh, it's, its final show is uh, The Reckoning, and the show is sold in... in uh, uh, well, the, the company isn't actually sold until 2017, so it may make a comeback, you never know. But uh, the last show that takes place is in uh, 2003, and all of their titles of, uh, um, essentially, uh, unified with TNA. the TNA titles, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, that was awful. So the shows actually get better because they get more TNA people in it. It's like you get your Chris Saban and AJ Styles and Christopher Daniels appearing on future shows. Like, the, like their final match, their final pay per view match is Sting against uh, Jeff Jarrett. So that's, that's not fair. bad. So we essentially, so yeah, well, that's the end of the October one. It's kind of a, a longer one, but that's because we've got two reviews. So we hope you have enjoyed this one anyway, because it, sometimes you have to take some of the rough shows with the smooth ones. Some of the rough news with the smoothie news. 2001 is not a super positive year in many respects. 2001 is very much a a serious look at what wrestling would be for the next decade plus. Yeah. It's important that we do it, but it doesn't mean that we have to enjoy or appreciate everything that went on at that point. So, but it's it's been a good chase through history now. We've got two more shows left to do. Uh, so on the November edition, we'll be looking at we'll give a like a little look into Rebellion 2001 taking place in the UK, and the XWF have a look about the, what happened on their tapings, and the big final review will be Survivor Series 2001, the battle between WWF and the Alliance comes to a head finally, and yeah, so that's what we have to look forward to. It's that and December, and then we're done on this journey. Ah. Ah, it's going to be a, a little bittersweet to uh, get out of the DeLorean with you in a couple of months. But at the same time, God, it's getting a little cramped. Yeah, it's yeah. getting a little warm in here. Yeah, it's just getting like... a little warm. I think it's starting to stink. I think we need to open up the windows. Yeah. So, like I said uh, before, if you have any thoughts or comments, feel free to leave them before. Make sure you click the bell for notifications and subscribe to Smart Out Moment. Uh, would throw out some of your plugs there, Rob, before we yeah. get off. Yeah, um, follow me on Twitter and Instagram at Dude Felice. You can check out everything else I'm doing in the wrestling world over on Fightful.com, WrestleZone.com, uh, eWrestlingNews.com. And I, I would always like to say that these podcasts are wonderful, but this is 98% a Callum Wiggins production, and I'm just glad to be along for the ride. Callum does a lot of research for this, and it should be commended, and I know a lot of people are actually enjoying these, and that is largely on the shoulders of Callum Wiggins. I wouldn't say 98%. 90% is fine. Okay. <laughs> no, nah, it's good to have someone to bounce these ideas off of, because I, I don't think it would be quite as enjoyable to just be regurgitating facts at people for a couple of hours. But, yeah, this was, this was quite an interesting one. If you want to keep up with some stuff that I'm doing, you can follow me on Twitter at Wigmeister14. And, yeah, just make sure you're reading the articles like the Power Rankings on SmartCampMoment.com. Uh, follow Tony on at, at Tony Mango. Uh, next week, we have some stuff to look forward to. It'll be the uh, predictions for Crown Jewel and also the post-show for Crown Jewel. I believe well. it'll also be uh, Mount Rushmore of... Comedy characters. Yes, with the Patreon stuff. 
final talk about that where if you want to just donate to see if you have any ideas or you really want us to do something then just head to the patreon choose the pickle poison pick your poisons here and we'll do whatever you say you become our commanders yeah if you want us to rebook all of world wrestling all-stars please don't but if you give us enough money we will yeah give us that might be a slightly higher price tier than the 20 dollars, but yes we might have to might have to negotiate that but Anyway, thank you all very much for listening. This has been another Small Count Moment, and we are being counted out. Ah!